You're listening to the Benrod Podcast. On this episode, I speak with Saad Alaziz, owner of Semper Fortis Jiu-Jitsu here in San Antonio. As always, this podcast is sponsored by Powertrain Tape, the best tape for grappling and climbing. Enjoy the show. Two, one. Professor Saad, thank you for being so, on the podcast. So good to be here. Really Thanks for having it. me. Man, Shoot. it's, a, it's, it's a, an incredible it's an honor. honor. No, the honor's mine. I've been wanting to have you on for a while, and I, I finally uh, it reached out, and uh, I was excited that you accepted. Oh, yeah. yeah. Anytime I have an opportunity to drink coffee with friends, I'm hey, there. It's I'm good, there. right? Honestly, so the dirty secret is this why I started this podcast uh-huh. is because I found that I was so rarely sitting down. Like, there's so many people that I want to spend quality time with. Right. And I just so rarely would just proactively reach Mm -hmm. out and say, hey, let's get together, right? Because work and family and and all these other priorities take over. And now it's like, well, you know, this is, this is a hobby, but it's kind of work. I mean, I got the brand, you know, uh, prominent out there. So technically I can, I can qualify this as work. Yeah. So, and it's, I got that banner in my school. I appreciate it's, you having that up and representing. It's the best tape, best finger tape on the market. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Absolutely. How much do I owe you? Oh, none. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Certainly hook you up with some tape before you leave. That's for sure. Yeah, my wife said we, I, I need to get a resupply. Okay. So, cool. Okay, yeah. I'll hook you up. I we'll got, do that. I got boxes. Right. Um, so, I, so we should do an introduction first. Cool. Um, so, so Professor Saad Alaziz, mm-hmm. um, your owner of Semper Fortis Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, black belt mm-hmm. owner of right. Semper Fortis Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, retired Navy mm-hmm. of 33 years, right. retired Lieutenant Commander, yes. correct? Yeah. And I have to tell you, full disclosure, I don't know what that means. Right. I know you got a lot of, a lot yeah. of bling right. on your uniform, but I'm assuming that's kind of a big deal. Yeah, it was, well... I'd like I to. I mean, you're going to be humble. Yeah, I know, sure. I know. But it took but, you a while to get there. It did. I, yeah. Because um, my first 16 years, I was enlisted. And then um, I got my bachelor's degree on my off time. And then I got commissioned as an officer. And then, so my last 17 years in the Navy, I was an officer. Oh, okay. So lieutenant commander in the Navy is the same rank as a, a major in the Air Force or Army. Okay. And you, um, you got your degree in, in health administration? My master's, master's. Is, yeah. is in uh, health care administration. Okay. Um, my bachelor's was in business administration. Okay. And they both helped me when, I, when it was time to actually open my business. Oh, yeah. I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I want to cover that. So, so some things I'd really like to cover on the podcast. And we, we chatted a, bit, a little bit on, um, on the live feed mm-hmm. through Facebook, right. but we, we, should, we should cover that too. Um, some things I'd really like to cover during this conversation. Obviously, I'd like to, to discuss your time in the military and understand cool. how that kind of um, helped frame your perspective of the world uh, mm-hmm. just as a man, as a business owner, as an individual. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd like to talk about um, you know running a small business. Um, my, my theory, and I'm probably I'm guessing this is probably correct, is um, you know you 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 planned years in advance that you knew you were going to retire. Mm-hmm. And so you began building building mm-hmm. this business right. during that period of time. Um, that's when I met you. It's been a year and a half, two years now. Mm-hmm. It's hard to believe. Yeah, the and Kit been, Dale seminar. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And then you've been in business for, what, three, three years? years? Matter of fact, today is my three-year anniversary. Oh, exactly. anniversary. Because we opened up on uh, 19, se- 19 of September 2016. Oh, wow. And here we are three years yes, later. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and you've got a growing, thriving school. It's done um, really well. I would say that, um, you know, from when I visited, mm-hmm. the, the culture is very family friendly. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you and your wife really set right. that tone. We try. I think anybody listening, I'm yeah. assuming a lot of people from your school will be listening and they're probably I hope so. nodding along right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, for, and from appearances right. too, I mean, I did a bit of research on your, on your page too, and um, I found that, you know, quite a few of the posts were just people from your school posting mm-hmm. about how much they you know, love and respect mm-hmm. you guys. So, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So I, I think that's a yeah. tribute to you guys. So, um, yeah, so those are the things I, I felt we talked mm-hmm. about a lot. And then obviously jujitsu. Right. And so, um, you know, I hope that doesn't discourage people who don't right. train jujitsu. But, right. you know, if you listen to enough people, so first of all, um, you know, there's a there's a running joke. I'm sorry, vegans, but if there's a running or CrossFitters, I'll throw uh, CrossFitters sure. on the bus, right? There's a running joke that it's like, how do you how do you know somebody is a vegan? Well, mm-hmm. you, you don't have to. What do you ask? Right. How do you know? It's you right. don't have to. They'll tell you. Sure. Right? Same yeah. with CrossFitters. Right. We're guilty of that too. Right. 
Oh yeah. It's like, we're gonna yeah. tell you about Brazilian yeah, jiu-jitsu. We're gonna yeah. Tell you. It, it, it's just like, how's the weather? Great day for Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Rain or shine, we can train. That's yeah. right. So, um, so it's gonna come up no matter what. Mm. But um, so I guess so I guess to get things started, um, can you tell me? So you, you talked a little bit about um, you, you started to begin to talk about your time in the Navy. Mm -hmm. um, so. What I was curious about and kind of where I was leading with, with the degree is how did that apply to your time in the Navy? Why yeah. did you pursue a, a master's in, uh, in healthcare, mm -hmm. healthcare administration? administration. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, because ironically, when I joined in February 1986, I, I didn't even have a GED. I was a 10th grade high school dropout. Wow. And um, the Navy, I went to join the Marine Corps, and the Marine Corps was pretty robust at the time, and they're like, if you can't do four years of high school, you can't do four years of the Marine Corps. So I was pretty dejected. I was like, what year was this again? 1986. 86. Yeah. Wow. Ronald Reagan was president. Okay. Yeah. So we had a, a large right. military. They we were, did. They just said, hey, we're good. We, they're like, we're good. And then this Navy recruiter was like, hey, you interested? Because I was at the recruiting station because I needed a job. And he's like, hey, you ever thought about the Navy? And I'm like, well, I want to waste your time. You know, I'm a high school dropout. You know, and he's like, oh, you're not going to waste my time. In the Navy, we'll take high school dropouts. I'm like, oh, really? Can I ask why you dropped out? Um, I had a lot of family issues. Okay. Um, my father and I, we didn't get along. Um, and, you know, I, I guess I had on and off troubles, you know, throughout my childhood, trying to find my direction. Yeah. And so. The most interesting people yeah, to have. I dropped out. And um, at 16, I got a job. And I supported myself. And then. As soon as I was 17, I was trying to get into the Navy, into the military, because I wanted a more secure job. Okay. Because I what actually were you worked, doing to support yourself? What did you want to get out? I of? worked at a Korean restaurant. Okay. And um, because some of my friends were uh, tough. Um, my closest friends at the time, their family owned the restaurant, so they hired me. And oh my gosh, it's still the hardest job I've ever had in my mm -hmm. life. Like cleaning the restaurant, you know, the grill. Um, the garbage, um, the food preps. Anybody, yeah, I, I think anybody that complains about you know service at a restaurant has no idea the level of effort yes. it goes into. You're, I would assume to this day you're much less likely to, right. if they close at nine, walk in at eight forty-five right. and, mm -hmm. and order a bunch of food. Yeah, you know, or it's or a tough job about, to have. I mean, there's standards to maintain too, but yeah, it's. Uh, I remember coming off some eleven-hour shifts. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like. Um, you know, I would do back end food prep and then I was also a dishwasher right. and running back and forth all day. And then when it closes, that's mm. when your real work begins, right? right? That's when you're, you're, you're cleaning and yeah. scrubbing everything down and, and getting it spick and span for the next morning. And then if you cut any corners, that's the day the health inspection shows up. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, yeah. you know, so it's you don't want to be that constantly right. focusing on cleanliness. Yeah. And so that was a so tough you, job. So you, is it fair to say you weren't necessarily running towards the military? Maybe you were running away. I needed a job. Yeah. I was like, that, you know, supported me more okay. than um, working at the restaurant. And so, you know, when the Navy took me, it was like, oh, man, this changes everything. And that's, it literally changed my life because then I had like a full-time job. And then, plus, you know, the, the Navy would keep me in, I could live in the barracks or live on the ship. Mm -hmm. So not only did I have you know, my food taken care of, but I had my living quarters taken care of. Yeah. And, you know, there was, it, it changed my life. Yeah. So I, I really Especially got lucky. You didn't, you didn't have a support structure, so it's like it became, it became your family probably in a lot of ways. Yeah, it was like, it was me and, you know, making it in the military. And there was like no other choice other than making it. So I remember going through boot camp in 86, and it was like, it, it, there wasn't a choice of like, oh, well, what if I don't make it, you know? It's like, no, I've got to make it. I need yeah. this job. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to go back and work at the Korean restaurant. <laughs> it's a good and bad place sure. to be in, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't, maybe enough, not enough people have been up against that, that rock and hard place where right. they really had to, to dig deep. Yeah, because I was done living at my parents' house, so it was like, no, you really got to make this in the military. So the, the Navy became my life, and I got in, and I didn't think I'd get in when the Navy, you know, because I thought, like, oh, the Marines take everybody. And when they're like, no, we're not going to take you. you said that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was the lowest right. ASVAB score. I mean, right. physically you had to be in good sure. condition. They care right. about that. But, um, and, yeah, I'm not going to talk bad about right. it because I didn't. Oh, they're know. great. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, like, you know, like my stepfather, you know, he, he had been drafted into the Marines. Yeah. You know, so I thought, shoot, you know, if, if 
if they force people to come in, then it's like, <laughs> oh, for sure they're going to take me. Yeah, that must have been a special level of dejection. Yeah, it was and like, we was oh, like, man. yeah, the Marines will take anybody, but they won't take you. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, the so Navy said, taking me, I was like, I can't believe this. I got a job. And, yeah. Well, you usually, yeah, you think the Navy's a little tougher right. to get into, but I guess it just yeah. depends on what they're hiring for right. at the time, right? Like an organization. Well, because at the time, we was, you know, Ronald Reagan in the United States, we was building up a force to go against the Soviet Union. And so we was working on a 600 ship Navy. That was the goal. Mm. And like today, I think we have a, a, a Navy that's under 300 ships. Mm. I, you know, so to get to that 600 ship Navy, he had to, you know, take in a lot of other people that mm -hmm. maybe, you know, you wouldn't take in a peacetime environment. Oh, you know? spelled opportunity for exactly. you exactly yeah you, you took it so and that's you, how I ended up so you signed up and then so what were you doing initially I started as a signalman okay. and uh, we did flashing light with Morse code and we hoisted flags we identified other countries ships and what type of ships they were and what country they was from and it was an incredible job yeah. you know and I had a blast and I just knew like oh no this is the life for me I'm, I'm just gonna keep doing this so how does that work when you decided you were going to go? You were going to go back to school, um, or, or I'd say, mm -hmm. well, return return to school, but right. basically you'll get your GED right. and then begin to pursue some degrees. Yeah. How did you make that decision? Well, you know, like I, um, I wanted to, um, you know, advance myself, and in the Navy, it, during that time, if I didn't have my GED after my first four years in the Navy, I wouldn't be able to reenlist. So they would take me in the Navy without having my GED, but to re-enlist after four years, I'd have to get it. So after you know two years in the Navy, I was like, I better get this because so I'm, gonna, you, I'm gonna keep so this you started, job. You started studying like the first two years while you were right. in there rather than taking time. And so was that all, that was all GI Bill stuff? Um, no, because you just went down to the Educational Services Office and you'd take the GED test. Oh, that's great. And they would help you through with it. You know, They'd help you study and then take the test. So once I got the GED, it was like, okay, now I can re-enlist in the Navy. Yeah. So this might go on for a while. And then I, after a while, you know, I was meeting other people in the Navy who had bachelor's degrees who were going to college. And I was like, I, I can't do college. You know, this is not for me. And then some of my- how self-limiting right? we are sure. sometimes, right? Yeah. Now in retrospect, you're like, how could I have thought that? Right. But you know, then I had some coworkers who got their bachelor's degrees and I'm like, I work with this dude every day. I don't. <laughs> I don't think he's that sharp. Yeah. You know, like if he can do it, yeah. maybe I can I do it. With a few of those. And um, and what I found the key was was like I just stopped um, watching TV, mm -hmm. and that found I found out I had a lot of time on my hands. You know, I missed, you know, all the episodes of the Cosby Show and Seinfeld and Friends. You know that happened through the nineties, right? I saw a picture. Oh yeah, me and Poncherelli. Oh, that was awesome. <laughs> on, on Facebook, right. on his Facebook, there's a picture with him and Ponch. Yeah. And what's really cool is it's me, Ponch, and my son. But it's a picture of my son before he joined the San Antonio Police Department because he's a police oh, officer. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's great. So that you know, it was like a childhood, um, you know, hero, and at the same time, my son. Was becoming a police officer. You have, you have so a son and a daughter, right? Mm -hmm. Is there any more that I don't yeah. know? Just those two. Okay. So my it, son's 26 and he's a police officer here in San Antonio. Yeah. And my daughter is 12 and she's just the apple of my eye. Yeah. <laughs> it keeps me young. Good. Yeah. It changes you. I, I, I would like to talk, I don't have a daughter, so at some point I would like to, to understand how the difference between a daughter and a son and those dynamics. Oh. Um, but yeah, please continue your story. You were, you were work. you decided yeah. you, you can, you could probably do this. You have mm -hmm. extra time. And the hardest part of um, getting my college degree was just um, signing up for that first class because my fear was of being in class with like 20 people. And, um, you know, the instructor would be talking and 20 people would be nodding their head like, yeah, we got this, what's next? And I would be shaking my head like, Ooh, I don't understand what's happening here. <laughs> and I think my first my first class was English. I took an English class and a, an intro to ethics. So it was a philosophy class. So I signed up for two, and once I had completed those, I knew I'm like, oh, I can do this. And um, so that those classes were in '92, and then I got my associate's degree in 1997, and then. 
I just kept going to class on nights and weekends and I got my bachelor's degree in 2001. And, you know, so it took me roughly nine years going part time on nights and weekends. Mm -hmm. But and I missed a lot of uh, entertaining TV shows. But once I stopped watching TV and then I would just do my college classes and then I would also do martial arts. Back then I did in the 80s, I did boxing and then in the, in the 90s, I did Hapkido and I got a black belt in Hapkido and then I transitioned to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in the 2000s. But by limiting, you know, my TV intake, it just gave me so much more time. Yeah. You know, because it's like, it's amazing how many people, when they get off work or, you know, after a hard day of school or whatever, and they sit there and they watch TV and you watch a couple of episodes and now three hours is down. But those same three hours, you could have been in a martial arts class or a college class, and you're going to be so much more productive than trying to figure out, you know, you know what Phil Huxtabee's doing. Or it's yeah, living vicariously through somebody else. Sure. And their standards. My my wife and I, we unplugged around. We got married in 2003, and mm -hmm. then around 2004 is when we unplugged cable. It was when right. Netflix was just starting to, to do the delivery service. Right. Right, and um, it was the same situation where we're both going to school, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, we realized one evening, so we were working hard during the day because we're trying to grow our, you know, respective careers, and then all of a sudden it was 9.30, 10 o'clock at uh -huh. night, and we're just like, what happened? What sure. happened this evening? Right. And I think I watched more commercials than actual shows. Right. So yeah, we were we disconnected as well, where it was just like this doesn't make sense for us. I, I'm st I'll still binge occasionally on a Netflix sure. show right. or like or um, uh, or a, a HBO show or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, but um, but yeah, it's the same same thing. It's yeah. like it's a colossal waste of time. But if we do it, it's because as a family we decided. Right. All right, we're gonna sure. be bums tonight. Right. We're getting yeah. some food. We're coming upstairs, right. and we're just gonna chill. And, but usually, the work has already been put right. in. So I still rarely, even though I'm done with my college, I still rarely ever watch TV. Although I did get sucked into Game of Thrones. Yeah, I was gonna say Game of oh Thrones. Oh my gosh, <laughs> dude! I, I, yeah, it's by far the best show I've ever seen in my yeah. life. Yeah. And I got so sucked into it. Like, um, I remember the Red Wedding episode, and I couldn't sleep that night worrying about what was gonna happen to the two Stark kids mm -hmm. that no, you know, they just lost their mother and their brother and like, and the family had had such a hard time. Yeah. And I'm laying in bed and, you know, and now apparently I'm talking to myself because I'm like, sod, this is a fictional show. The kids are just <laughs> fine. <laughs> yeah, they're good. I'm losing sleep over they're this. The, the kids are fine. Yeah, somewhere. like they're doing great, you know. <laughs> but, uh, oh man, I got, I got brought into that show, and I'll have friends that are like, oh man, you gotta see this, it's a new episode on Netflix, and I'm like, no. Because I got sucked into Game of Thrones, and I spent yeah. more time than I cared to. You've tasted the addiction. Right. Yeah. And, and I think it was like nine seasons. Because I, I wanna say we started watching it in 2010. Well, and, eight, it, the last season was terrible. Uh, I, I'm just not right. happy with it. It's the same thing as Lost, too. I got sucked into Lost. Sure. I just wasn't happy the way right. it ended. But I don't know how you end a show like that anyway. No. Um, without either it's going to be a super happy ending or everybody's sure. going to die yeah. and anything in between. No I knew it wasn't going to be a happy ending because of all the episodes, you know, like to me, the happy ending was like John and um, uh, the Khaleesi getting married, living happily ever after, mm -hmm. running the kingdom. But I knew like... You no, know, she'd already set herself up as yeah, a bad guy. Right. You, and You can't burn you can't right. burn women and children and like be like, well, but she's a yeah, bad guy. Yeah, right. It's like... No, you kind of alienated, alienated that, the audience. That was the only thing that disappointed me in the last season was that when they true. turned her into a bad guy. Yeah. Because I, if they was going to kill her off, I would have much rather she died with the she night. She was game. already becoming yeah. a tyrant. It was just right. it, was, it was it was watching the watching her gain power was mm -hmm. amazing. Watching her abuse power was sure. terrifying. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, yeah, that's its own podcast, man. Sure. I mean, oh yeah, the, Game of yeah. Thrones. Oh yeah. my gosh. Oh, I <laughs> So, like I said, I got sucked into it. <laughs> so, so you said you mentioned you mentioned you spent the the, the, the I guess the second half or the the, the twenty years um, as an officer. Mm -hmm. um, how, how how did that work? Like, did you have to leave the navy and then come back to it, mm -hmm. or you just put in your? No, it was really weird. Whatever for yeah, the, like I put in the application, and um, I'd applied for supply officer because I was a 
I majored in business administration at Intel officer because I had a top secret clearance. And um, then a friend of mine, like a week or two before the selection board, well, the package was due to the selection board, was like, hey, we should apply medical service corps officer. And I'm like, dude, I'm not even CPR qualified. Let alone I wasn't a corpsman, I was a signalman. Yeah. I'm like, why would I apply for that? And he's like, oh no, they're looking for people with management and administrative experience. And I'm like, okay, so we just fixed up the package. I went into my commanding officer and he's like, you wanna do this? And I'm like, well, you know, I'd like to give it a shot. And um, so we fired off the package and the Navy also had my supply officer and intel package back, but those boards results came later. And the Medical Service Corps came back really quick and was like, hey, you've been selected as an ensign in the Medical Service Corps. I'm like, what? Thank and you, uh, my CO was like, do you want to accept this or do you want to wait on the results of the other two? And I'm like, no, the bird in the hands were two in the bush. I'm, I'm going to take this. Yeah. And uh, so I had to figure I out what a Medical life. Service Corps officer was. And um, it was really strange because I was a chief in the Navy at the time, which is an E7 rank for enlisted. And um, I walked into my ceremony in my khakis with my chief rank. They um, you know, did a little speech. They changed the ranks on my collar. And I left in the same uniform I showed up with. The only thing different was instead of chief anchors on my collar, I had um, ensign bars, mm. which are just 01 rank in the uh, okay. officer corps. And that's what I walked out with. And I remember when I walked out, of the building with my family, some enlisted guys were coming towards me and they went to salute me. And I, and I thought, oh, somebody's behind me. And then I realized, <laughs> no, they're saluting me. <laughs> and I had to return that salute. So did, that that, was, did that feel, um, what's it called, like imposter syndrome? Was there a second yeah, like, imposter syndrome? Because like, like, after all those like, years of being leave. enlisted, I'm yeah. Still sad. Right. You know, and, and now people are saluting me, calling me sir, and I'm like, oh, that, that's just strange. It's yeah. like, it almost felt like an elevator in an outhouse. It's like, it just didn't belong, but here I was. And yeah. now people are saluting me, calling me sir. And so it was, it felt strange, but you know, because I was wearing the exact same uniform, there was no difference between an officer's uniform and a chief's uniform. Yeah, you probably got a really unique perspective right. into that, right? You're not coming it, in directly as an officer. Right. You know, so I had a lot of, you know, leadership experience at that point because I had, yeah. I had been at E7 for, I think, six years at the time I was selected. So I was used to, you know, leading people. And so that, that made the transition easier. I just yeah. had to get used to working in hospitals and setting up field units. And that was, that was an adventure. Now, what, what, so you, you clearly chose to stay in the Navy. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I think I can infer that you enjoyed doing what you were oh, doing. Oh, yeah, I but loved it. There's also, you know, it, that that applies directly. So a lot of, you know, military or ex-military that I talked to, one of the challenges that they have is they feel like that their skill set doesn't apply directly. Right. And, and I've talked about that before on the podcast. Right. It's something that makes me mad. It's like I agree when somebody says, you know, I was in charge of, you know, X number sure. of, of, you know, say Marines, for example, right. and millions of dollars of equipment, and then I come out and I'm not qualified to... Right. Um, and so I think some people self-limit, mm -hmm. but, but you, like you, yours applied directly. Right. Like you mm -hmm. could go to work for, you know, Sutter Health or, right. or, you know, any of the hospitals here in town. Yeah, but could the Navy, you know, I mean, they pay for all my education. And, you know, like I said, I came in, I was a high school dropout. So there's like, some loyalty there. And so, and then, you know, they end up sending me to Baylor to get my master's in healthcare administration. I saw your phone. Yeah. And, uh, oh yeah, yeah, I rocked my Baylor. Baylor. Yeah. yeah. Sick and bears. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, and the whole time I was sitting in Baylor going for my master's, you know, I joked with them. I'm like, you know, I'm waiting for the day that, you know, somebody, you know, from the dean's office comes in and says, hey, Saad, we, we need to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, you weren't supposed to get in here. <laughs> you got to go. But then I ended up walking the stage and they, they awarded me my master's degree. And I, I was bet like, you worked so much harder right. because of that, though. Just feeling it, like any day can be your last. Right, because I didn't, I didn't, I wanted to fit in. And I was, I was like, you know, you know, people were, when they was introducing the class, people had, some people there had PhDs or masters and other, mm -hmm. um, master's degrees in other fields. And I'm like, 
they got a GED from the great state of Virginia. And some of them I could see in their face, they're like, GED, what, what type of doctorate is that? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, that's a good enough degree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's what I had. And, but I mean, I had my bachelor's degree um, before I got into Baylor. But, you know, here I was going for a master's degree. And, you know, at the time it was like, you know, Baylor was, well, and they still are a very well respected yeah. educational institution. Yeah, and, I'm like, program. and I'm like, here I am, you know, am I supposed to be here? And, you know, after the first semester where, you know, I got all the grades in, I'm like, okay, I passed everything. You know, I did really well. Okay, I guess I, guess I belong. And then I got to walk the stage. But, like, I think, you know, like for military guys, a lot of us, you know, that we hold on to, um, you know, like what we did. You know, like I was in charge of all these people. You know, maybe I, you know, I was in charge of tanks or, you know, maybe I was with a SEAL team mm -hmm. or whatever it is that doesn't directly translate to a civilian job. I think like what we have to do while we're in is, you know, like make the transition. Like, you know, like the Navy didn't you know, forced me to get my bachelor's in business. You know, that was me forcing myself, yeah. stop watching TV, Just get educated, right. You know, but a lot of guys, and not all of them, but a lot of them do watch TV. They spend a lot of time, they waste a lot of time where they could have been better prepared to go out into the workforce. Mm -hmm. But instead they're like, uh, I don't even take no college classes or I don't, I don't need to get these other skills. What I have is enough, but what you have isn't enough. And yeah. it's not just for the military. It's like, you know, if in the 1800s, if, if you was the best buggy whip maker in the United States, you know, like you needed to make a transition when yeah. Ford came along with the automobile because yeah. your industry has gone. And it's like, if you're not ready to transition and you're still lamented, lament, uh, Excuse my English. Yeah, no, 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 if you're still bemoaning the fact yeah. that, hey, you know, I'm the best buggy whip maker in the United States and I can't get a job. Yeah. It's like, well, you need to find and start to transition, you know, how you're going to, what are you going to do when buggy whip making goes yeah. away? Reminds me of the book, Who Moved My Cheese? And it specifically yeah. pertains to that, right? It's like, it's like the, the goal, the goal moves, right. the, you know, what, what you get from your work, mm -hmm. your labor, it continues to move forward. Henry Ford said that if he listened to the advice of his peers, um, he would have made a faster carriage. Nice. I mean, if you right. listen to his sure. customer, yeah. you know what I mean? And so, yeah, that's, that's what drove it's, right. it's, those are the people that change things, but those are the people that are successful right. too is if you're looking at like if you're you're in a specific role whether it's military or a company and you just des you you decide to stagnate because you're comfortable mm -hmm. um, it in that moment it becomes a temporary job right it's it you you've already you've already kind of deprecated mm -hmm. yourself and and your ability to actually you know move forward or even stay current with and right now automation I mean cloud technologies artificial intelligence machine learning like it's you know there's going to be very few, I think Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is safe, right. right? There's going to be very right. few industries that are going to be um, safe from, mm -hmm. from the technology that's going to change. In fact, even, you know, even Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, so I'm going to get super woo-woo, but you know, with Elon Musk working on Neuralink, it's mm -hmm. going to connect directly into the brain. Um, if they can direct, connect directly into, you know, literally, they're called neural networks in computers, but for a reason, if it literally connects into your neural network, Who's to say it's not like Keanu Reeves, where it's sure. like, I know jiu-jitsu, yeah. right? I mean, but fortunately, right. yeah, you're good. <laughs> yeah, at least for a little while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give, give it a few years. Or, you know, like, what if, you know, like, on Facebook, every once in a while I see these videos where, like, somebody throws a chi ball, and from across the room, they knock somebody over. I'm still waiting to get hit by one of those. Or, you know, like, there's always some dude in Russia or somewhere in Asia where like people will come to attack him and he'll do something with his hands without touching them mm -hmm. and they'll fly all over the place. It's amazing. <laughs> and you know, if one of those arts turned out to be real, like if a dude came in and hit me with a chi ball and knocked me over, I'd take my um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt off Sign and I'd, tomorrow. you know, whatever that chi ball, That's whatever right. belt system they have, oh, be like, okay. <laughs> You know, I guess I put an X through the sign of the business and be like, yeah. okay, we are now a chi ball school. We're going we're gonna to throw these chi balls. First line of defense, chi ball. Right. Second, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Yeah, although I think I'd enter the world 
before I made the big change, just so I could start every match off. And I would get the takedown, Slap, knock him with my chi ball. Boom. Yeah. And then just, yeah, get right. your points. But if another art comes in and it proves itself to be superior to ours, we have to be willing to adjust. You know, like I was a black belt in Hapkido, and um, I went to an MMA school because was, I was in Beaufort, South Carolina, and there wasn't um, a Hapkido school there. Mm. And I was stationed there. I, I wasn't going to open up my own Hapkido program. But I was a black belt, and like I knew how to do um, kimuras. I knew how to do uh, guillotine chokes, mm. arm bars. Like I knew a lot of ground stuff and I, a lot of wrist locks. I knew I couldn't beat the Gracies on the ground. But when I went into that school, like I was like, but you know, like their brown belts and below are going to yeah. be cannon fodder for me. You know, like, you, got this. and yeah. I felt so bad for the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu brown belt that was rolling with me. Because I kept telling him, I'm like, you know, hey, I got a black belt and have keto. He's like, oh, that, he's that's, like, yeah, that's cool. That, that's cute. That's cool. <laughs> and, then, and then our five minute round, I think he tapped me out 10, 12 times. I don't yeah. know. Like, he just absolutely demolished me. And I'm like, what just happened here? And then the purple belts demolished me. And then the blue belts demolished me. And then some of their white belts were tapping me. And I'm like, what in the world? And like, my friends were like, you're going to stop being a hep keto black belt and be a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu white belt? Like, how can you make that transition? It's like, because, and hep keto is a wonderful martial art. I don't, I don't mean to you know, disparage it in any way, but. At the end of the day, so Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was more effective. Yeah. And so I let Hap Keto go. I stopped training in Hap Keto. And I started, I started as a white belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And I've never looked back. Now, I brought a lot of the wrist locks from Hap Keto over into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So, like, oh, it enhanced so what, my journey. What age, so how old were you when you did your first day on the mat with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? Mm, I think probably about maybe 35. Okay. Yeah, 35, so not, a, 35. not a young man. Right. I mean... At that point, you're, that's the right. oldest you've ever been, right? Yeah. Your free right. body, and you decide, hey, I'm gonna, right. I'm gonna go in on this. And I thought I knew stuff. Like right. I was like, I boxed in the '80s. You know, I've got a, I did have keto in the '90s. You know, like, like I'm, I'm, I'm a long time martial artist. So when I went in there, I thought like, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do really well. Mm -hmm. They might even ask me to teach. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't ask me to teach. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was so humbling, but like what I thought, you know, I thought I was an expert. I yeah. thought I was really good. Yeah. And these guys just showed me that, no, you've got a lot to learn. So I think what Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I mean, I need to be listening to you about what, no. what, about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but I think, I think one of the reasons why it, it became um, such a great martial art um, in many ways, it's what MMA is doing, and mm -hmm. I, I fear I fear that we're not adopting enough MMA. But there there are some progressive. Um, uh, we we are progressing, and you you know a lot of the ground game of MMA is based on jujitsu. But what jujitsu has been is very adaptable. So mm -hmm. It's a hybrid, right? right. So, um, and I was talking about this you know with somebody else before. Is is I think that jujitsu has won the marketing battle in some mm -hmm. ways because. Um, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, like I don't, I do some things, I do some Sambo things, right? right? Some two on one, um, you know, arm ties and some, uh, you know, some wrestle, there's some wrestling moves, you know, double leg, single leg, fire, mm -hmm. fireman's carry, things like that, that we don't go, oh, well, that's wrestling, right? right? We say, well, this is Brazilian right. Jiu Jitsu, mm -hmm. this is a Jiu Jitsu takedown. And I think that's the genius of, of, um, of the Gracies and the Gracie family is the ability to, to um, pull all these right. different components into a system, um, similar to what Bruce Lee was trying to do, mm -hmm. right? With um, what was his uh, Jeet Kune Do? Jeet Kune Do, yeah, yeah. And that was right. that was his idea. And mm -hmm. if he'd lived long enough, right. I think we'd be talking about you know some of Bruce Lee's ground mm -hmm. game and him adopting Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because that's the kind of practice yeah, he's he a was. serious. He student. would have had yeah. that same moment right. where he'd have been, he'd have been like, oh, I'm I'm a baby on the ground, right? You know. But I think I think that that's that's why it's it's here to stay is and what we need to do is continue to to make it adaptable and say well that is jujitsu, right. and I think that's what's what I really attracted me about Brazilian jujitsu because like in hapkido, along with a lot of the um, Eastern martial arts, there's a lot of um, ancestor worship, where like in hapkido there's a certain way to punch, certain way to kick, mm. and that's how Young Sul Choi, who founded hapkido, did it. If like somebody from karate or Muay Thai 
or boxing came in and showed another way to punch that, or kick that was more effective. And Hapkido would be like, no, this is the way Young Sul Choi did it. This is the way we're going to do it. That's, that's and, the guy that right. wants to watch TV. Yeah. And so it wouldn't progress. It's like, no, that's not Hapkido. Hapkido is doing it this way. And it's the same way with Aikido, karate, certain forms of kung fu. Yeah. You know, they're stuck in that ancestor worship. Where in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, for the Gracies, it was like, oh no, this, this particular way isn't working. Let's try it this way. Yeah. Oh, this works better. Or, you know, the guys in Sambo do it this way, or the guys in Judo, or uh, wrestling. And you know, like Holes Gracie was notorious for like getting with wrestlers and Judo practitioners. And, um, cross-training with them and that's why I think his black belts like Jacare Calvacante or Haja Gracie's father um, Mauricio Gomes why they were so effective in teaching others in building up these incredible associations because they were doing everything if, if Sambo has a better way to do it than Brazilian Jiu Jitsu let's do it that way mm -hmm. you know out with the old in with the new and there was no like um, or at least in the, our community, there's very little of like, well, Elio passed the guard this way. And if it was good enough for Elio, that's going to be good enough for me. Yeah. Where in most parts, it's like, yeah, Elio passed the guard this way, but I like this guard pass yeah. better. It's more effective. Yeah. Or, and so it's like, there's no, well, Elio did it this way, so we're going to do it this way. Or Carlos did it this way, so we're going to do it this way. It's like, no, we found a better way. Or this is maybe not a better way than Elio's way but this is a better way for me in my jiu-jitsu journey. That's true, that's a good yeah. point. Everybody's body's so different. But in, and so, in a lot of that adaptation, probably what, um, I guess the forge of that is is live sparring, mm -hmm. live training. It's there, there, you know, we don't, like, we'll do drills and stuff, mm -hmm. but we're not going through like, uh, whatever it's called, like a formation, right? right? Where we have to know certain katas and, right. and other, you know. That's kind of one of my issues with, you know, and I, I don't know if this is right or wrong. It's just something I haven't done. But I know that there's a lot of um, some schools that do, you know, you have to pass tests right. in order to get you know, your next advancement or mm -hmm. your next belt. And I feel like the, the, the crucible is how you roll with the other right. people mm -hmm. and a variety of people, right. you know, mm -hmm. long people, short yeah. people, strong people, right. weaker young people, you know, and, and the control that you have over your right. body. Um, rather than like, yeah, I can throw up a triangle sure. to, un, right. un, you know, to somebody who's not right. fighting me. Yeah, how do you do it in live action? Yeah. And like, I don't do, um, at my school, I don't do um, tests. And I don't have anything against the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu schools that yeah. do. You know, like, I respect their, their views because, you know, there's more than one way, you know, to skin the proverbial cat. What I do is like, I roll with all my students. And then when I'm not rolling with them, I watch them roll and I watch their, them do the technique in class. And I watch like, okay, does this, if I show a technique, does this person do the technique? Or when they roll, do they continue to do the same old thing they've always done that doesn't work so well? Mm. Or do they institute like this new back escape I just showed today? Or, oh no, you got your back taken and you continue to do that same thing that you've always done that don't work. You're not so evolving. it's like, yeah, so like I know whether this person knows how to scissor sweep or not yeah. because I watch you. It's like, or I've rolled with you. And it's like, yeah, you have no idea how to scissor sweep. You know, it's like, and then when I tell them, it's like you don't have to compete to promote, but when you compete, it gives me another opportunity to watch you. Yeah. Because I'm not doing anything else while you're competing. I'm watching you totally, and I can see like, oh, can you escape out of side control? Yeah. Or, or when you get inside control, are you just stuck there? Like there's no getting out. Or, you know, can you pass, you know, the De La Hiva guard? Oh, matter of fact, you can. I didn't even think you could do it. Like <laughs> I'm, sometimes my students surprise me in the tournaments. Like I didn't, I yeah. didn't think he knew this. They probably surprised right. themselves. Especially the, the smaller ones, um, you know, to suddenly be able to, or not the smaller ones, the big ones too. Mm. When you're suddenly able to train with somebody who is, your belt rank, your right. size, your age, your right. gender, like all of a sudden it's 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 you staring right. back at mm. you on a different right. journey and you get to you get to test your metal against that yeah. person and the journey to get to that tournament, mm. like I, I don't think there's enough emphasis placed on the fact that like I, I've heard people say it, but you know, just stepping out on the magic sure. victory. Yeah. But what they mean by that is like 
the months of hard work, the right. you know, the cutting weight, the eating healthy, the I don't want to go to class today, but I have to, right? The training, because yeah. I'm going to compete, right. and I don't want to regret. Yeah. If you lose your first match, you you won. Um, you know, I know you you say you don't promote people that compete strictly on that right. criteria, yeah. but people who compete tend to get promoted faster. Yes, There's a reason sure, for that. yeah, because you can see them and. If you compete, you have a tendency to train more, you know, and, um, you know, go out there and, you know, give it a shot. And, you know, like I tell my guys, I'm like, if you go out and, you know, I compete a lot. So they've seen me win. They've seen me lose. Third place at you know, Worlds. Yes. That's in both my weight class and in the absolute. So, like, I was, I was really stoked about that performance. You know, like, everybody wants to win gold, but the reality of the jiu-jitsu tournament is... 50% of the people lose their first match. You know, like, Masters is right. harder. Yeah. I, I, well, right. it's, it's arguable, right? You're talking about like peak. Right. But when you go, you're going into Masters, you're talking about like, it's like this refinement. Right. Like so many people are going to compete and then get injured, sure. drop out, right? right? You're going to lose a lot of people. But then you go to Masters and that's where like, like names of people that like yeah. you know you grew up in your in your your training hearing right. their names and now suddenly they're staring back at you yeah and they want to kill you right that's <laughs> it's crazy like <laughs> you're like what am I doing on the mat with this person it was the craziest thing um because um twice now I've had the honor of competing against Megaton Diaz mm -hmm. and he's a six degree black but he competed in the first um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu World Championships in '96 as a black belt. I wasn't even doing Brazilian. I was still doing Hapkido in 96. Yeah. And I wasn't even a black belt in Hapkido in 96. Like, this dude is legendary. And I, I competed against him in the Austin Open this year. And then I competed against him again in the Pan Ams in the Absolute Division. And um, the dude is incredible. Sorry. Like, and where it used to be, you know, white belt to brown belt, I competed against other older guys that started jiu-jitsu later in life. Like, mm -hmm. I started in my 30s. We're now at 51, as a black belt, I'm competing against guys who are legendary, you know, like Megaton, or, you know, and the Master Worlds had the tournament broken a different way. It could have been Mario Sperry, or a year, a couple years before, it could have been Carlson Gracie Jr. It's like legendary dudes, and then even in the Worlds this year, I didn't know until after the match, like my first opponent in my weight class was a seventh degree coral belt. Because he just wore a black belt with a white tab. And Ooh, after the match. A bit, huh? Well, because That's nobody surprising. wears the coral belt in oh, the in okay. the world. But he was he is a coral belt. And I was like, wow, like what an honor to be able to compete against him. And that dude, he brought it to me. It was it was an incredibly tough match. Can you get your coral belt in your fifties? I thought he might he must have yeah. started very young. I That's, I'd have to do the math, but um I thought you I'd have to look at it, but I know your right. first your first degrees. Mm -hmm. It's like it's every three years, and right. after that, it extends every out five, further, right? And then it's like every seven, yeah. and yeah. So he's he's been a coral belt for a couple of years, and um, so, but here I am, you know, going against this legendary guy, and he had flown in from Rio because he headed up the uh, Gracie Hamada Cata Academy in Niteroy, mm -hmm. and uh, just to have the honor to go against him, and but somebody that's so talented that. You know, he's, he's probably forgotten more jiu-jitsu than I'll ever learn. And that's how it is in tournament jiu-jitsu when you, when you hit to black belt. You know, so when you get black belt one day, you know, you're going to be looking across and see, oh, here's this legendary Gracie, and now you, you yeah. get to go against him. And, man, it's cool. It's, it is so cool. How do you um, – so we touched on this a couple of times, so I want to make sure to, to talk a little bit about it. Um, you know, you're in your fifties. You started in your your mid thirties. Um, how do you how do you stay healthy and keep rolling with with all of your? It's your an pursuits? adventure. It's an adventure. Yeah. You know, like because you know, like when you get, to, you know, like when you're fifth. Like I turned fifty one in two months, and um, you know, like I I tell my friends, like you really have to focus on your health at this age because you know the reality of it is I've lived more years on this earth than I have left. Yeah, every once in a while somebody makes it past the century, you know, a hundred years. But like okay. maybe the we're average, at, we're at that spot, sure. maybe you get enough stem cells in you. But the average lifespan of a U.S. male is seventy-eight. You know, 
So 27 years isn't a whole lot of time. So yeah, I spend a lot of time um, on my health. You know, so jujitsu is great for my cardio. It gives me my workout. But like I watch what I eat. Like, you know, yeah. we was joking earlier about how do you know if somebody's a vegan? Oh, they're going to tell you, yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, like I'm not a vegan. I'm, I'm a, a pescatarian. Yeah. So here I am telling yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. I but, didn't have to ask. See? And uh, yeah. <laughs> and but health wise, like I had high cholesterol. And I was like, well, you know, I was asking the doctor because the doctor was interested in putting me on medication. I was like, well, what can I do to get not be on cholesterol yeah, medication? Be and he's like, if you work out more. I'm like, dude, you have no idea how much I work out. Like, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, well, really, you know, it's the red meat. You know, um, your meat intake is what's causing your cholesterol to be so high. And so um, I was like, so what can I do? And I didn't want to go straight vegetarian. So both the Diaz brothers and Crone Gracie are all pescatarian. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, they all fight MMA and they all do jujitsu mm -hmm. and they're keeping their strength, you know, on this diet. And plus the Diaz brothers, they do triathlons. Yeah. I'm like, maybe I'll try this and see how it does. So I went cold turkey and I stopped eating um, beef, chicken, pork, turkey, you know, if it didn't come from the ocean, I just, that, that was my only meat source. Not that shrimp and fish don't have eggs cholesterol. And dairy and stuff like that, I that? still do the eggs and dairy. Okay. Um, so that's like, I guess the people that don't do the eggs and dairy are the vegans, but the vegetarians, I believe do do the eggs and dairy. No. But the pescatarians. Yeah. I think pescatarian don't. is just, it's fish and vegetables and right. stuff. I, I think I, I hate to say this because it's I'm gonna get it wrong, but I think it's something like octo pescatarian. Maybe where you also eat eggs and uh, stuff. Could be, but yeah, like, yeah it's so. uh, it, vegans. It's no, yeah, it, it, but a vegetarian I believe will also eat some animal products, right. but right. not the animal. Right. I think yeah. The meat is the I think that's differentiator. It. And vegans, yeah. they're just, they're not gonna touch any part. Sure. Of it. Some of them don't even yeah. eat honey. Right. Good for them. If but, you say so. But I only I only changed. <laughs> I didn't change to lose weight. I didn't change, you know, for any moral reason. Like I'm not opposed to, you know, killing cows to eat them or anything like that. I changed because I wanted my cholesterol to go down and I wanted sense, health yeah. reasons. And um, so, you know, at first I was only gonna do it for a couple months. And then I was like, then I can go into moderation mm -hmm. of like the, my meats because I was like, Chama Gauchas here in town. I was like their number one customer. I went two or three times a month. Well, it must have been sad. All you can eat. Yeah, yeah like, I, now I take my wife there because she's she still eats, you know, all the meats, but I just eat the salad bar. And she's like, really? Are you going to do that? They got a nice salad bar. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And and plus their customer service is amazing. Mm -hmm. They're not paying me to say this, but, you know, I, I give them that free <laughs> shout out. Like, yeah. of all the restaurants I've been in in the world, like, I've never been to a place that has better customer so service attentive. than this place. Oh my gosh, they make you feel like a king. Like, and yeah. so I love the place, but I stopped eating their meats. And the irony was after three or four months, I thought I would go back, you know, off the pescatarian diet, back to a normal diet, but I lost my appetite for it. Mm -hmm. Like I started seeing steak it doesn't look like and chicken, anymore, right? and it, yeah. it no longer looked attractive. Yeah. And I was like, where it used to just make my mouth water, like, oh my gosh, look, I gotta eat this steak. It's where I started looking at it, I'm like, ah, it doesn't look that attractive. So then it became like, not that I'm not gonna eat meat ever again, it's just like, I'm not eating it today. I get it. Right. So so I make fun of vegans, sure. partially because, <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Who wanted? Well, no, I was right. one. So, so nice. we, we went vegan and we actually we went vegan raw. So I had a lot of health issues oh, wow. with my stomach. Yeah. Mm. And so we did that for about a year, but then I started to notice a cognitive decline mm. and inflammation in my body. And I realized uh -huh. that, well, the initial, I think, glow that I'd felt was right. moving away from refined foods, mm -hmm. refined carbohydrates. Yeah. But then I began to, I think, experience where maybe I wasn't getting all of the nutrition mm -hmm. needs that I needed. Sure. And then I found out that I was allergic to a lot of things, which is another completely different right. story. But um, I just think everybody's body is so different. But my, my point was, with the meat, I understand entirely. I right. began to not look at it as food anymore. Right. And I think that that's the microbiome. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, that you, you crave what you, you crave um, what you give your body. Right. And the reason for that is that bacteria co-evolved with mm -hmm. us. 
and it signals us like that's food I want. Right. That. Yeah. It wants to stay right. alive just like you do. Mm -hmm. So like if I started if I spent like six days drinking Coke, mm -hmm. the seventh day I'm gonna I'm gonna want a Coke. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. I need that sugar. I'm gonna need to feed that bacteria right. that's growing on it. So it's crazy the way yeah. our our bodies are an ecosystem, oh, yeah. and, and you, what you're putting in is is gonna impact the way your brain works. Right. And but like, you know, three years ago, if you said, "Hey, you you're not gonna be eating meat," I mean, like, you should have listened to Nancy Reagan in the '80s. Just say no to drugs. Say like no. whatever you're on. Yeah. Like, <laughs> there's no way. Like I'm gonna change my diet like yeah. that. And like I said, I didn't change it. You know, for any kind of moral reason. It was just a health reason. And yeah. that's how. In my 50s, you know, I, I stay healthy is because I really look at my intake. Like, I don't, I watch what I eat, you yeah. know, and what I drink or, you know, Everything I've heard so far out. about you is you're, you're adaptable. I try. You know, you uh, adapt. I think that's what they teach you in the military. They teach yeah. you to adapt. Yeah. You know? It's like, if you're a hardcore conservative, next thing you know, your boss is a hardcore liberal. And, and you get to share those ideas. Yeah. <laughs> and you get to bite your tongue or, you know, vice versa. Or, you know, like, that makes the best kind of person, yeah, right? I mean, you right. should be able to be able to hold somebody else's opinion in your sure. mind, whether you believe right. it or not, and respect that person yeah. as an individual. That's one of the and problems we're having right now I as think a country. The big problem that I see is, like, we've moved away from, like, debating about the issues. Like, we could sit here and debate, you know, whether Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is more effective than Sambo. And we can have a very intelligent conversation. I'm on the Sambo side. But, you know, but maybe you wouldn't, you know, because... Um, well, they don't do leg locks, right? That dude... Uh, more 50% of the body. Khalid, uh, no. Was it Khabib? Khabib. Yeah, Khabib. He's, he's making a very persuasive yeah. argument for killer. Sambo. Like, yeah. you know, because um, he's a Sambo expert and also a judo black belt. So, I mean, I but he's not... A, talking about. Those are jujitsu finishes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, and, he's, and it's, he's, leading the he's amazing. For yeah. Sambo. And yeah. it's like, I mean, if we're in Nogi, I don't think I can beat him on the ground, you know. And he's a white belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I think, I think the, the guy would beat me just like he beats all these other well, guys. You could, you yeah, know? yeah. You know, I, I, I respect what you're saying, sure. but, um, but there's something to be said about the athleticism. Mm. And he's doing some of the same things that we're doing. Sure. He just yeah. might not, he might not jump guard. Right. 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 Because, <laughs> yeah, because Sambo, you know, just like Judo and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, they right. all evolved from, yeah. you know, Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah. And, you know, they just went in a different direction. Forged, forged through right. actual fighting. Mm -hmm. that's, that's that. That's the, you know, it's the trying to control another human right. being through resistance. It's, yeah. it's the same forging process. And, but I think the key, you know, to the conversations that we have is that, you know, we could have... You know, just like we just did, you know, we just pointed out a few aspects, both pros and cons. Yeah. But I think where a lot of times in our society, it's like, yeah, but, you know, you're a freaking idiot. You know, where it's like, yeah. instead of arguing the point, you know, like, yeah, it's like it, it becomes, becomes a personal attack. Yeah. And then it's like, dude, now we can't, we can't, we'll never get yeah. into agreements because now you've made it incredibly personal. Like, yeah. you just... You just question my intelligence on this. Like, I, I, don't, I don't think I want to be your friend no more. Think, yeah, that's, that's, that's a rule breaker. In sure. Any, in any yeah. You've been married right. a long time, you know. Like, you don't, right. you don't attack the person. You yeah. attack the idea. Right. And, and hopefully it's an, an intellectual attack. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, something, uh, a simple um, straw man that you're throwing up. And the, the, one of the challenges is that, you know, the anonymity of the Internet. Right. So first we have to just, we have to look at the signal through the noise. And sure. if somebody's anonymous on the Internet, um, or, or they're just a miserable person right. in general. Like you kind of have to, you know, ignore that component. But it's also where we get our information. Mm -hmm. Now where we get our information, it's not single source or dual source, right? right. It's every source. Right. First yeah. thing you do is somebody shares something online and you're just like, you know, I don't want to say something that exists, but it's like, you know, info anti war 2000.org right. and it's yeah. just like uh you know somebody sure. in their basement right. bought that url and decided yeah. they're a, they're a news source right. and you're sharing their biased opinion yeah. and so we're all getting these different biased opinions and living in our own kind of content bubbles and then of course we're not going to see the world right. in the same way we're, we're we're both dining on completely different information yeah and like i think one of my favorite memes is like it's a picture of abraham lincoln and it says you know 
don't believe everything you read on the internet, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> you know, it's like, if, if you don't investigate it, you're give me and a you just quote, stop it right there. Yeah, yeah. It's like, well, Abraham Lincoln said, don't believe everything you read on the internet. <laughs> Seems legit. You know, sure, like, why not? You know, where, and so many people don't, you know, it's sort of like what you learn in college about, is this fact peer reviewed or is this just an opinion I'm throwing out? Yeah. And, you know, the wild world of the internet is like, there's a lot of opinions yeah. that aren't peer reviewed, you know. People aren't stopping to look, seems right. peer reviewed. Um, and I think, but I think that there's an evolution that's taking mm. place where we're, we're going to eventually begin to um, get to the get to the root of whether something is is in fact opinion or not. Mm. I, I just think that it, we've we've gone away from like a fact based news to a you know was if it bleeds it leads type right. of you know and it's and that's the that's the out with the old media and then we haven't figured out how to get the truth out of the new media yet. Right. Yeah. And I think part of the problem is that, like, we we hold all opinions as, like, valid. And, you know, like, let's say if we was talking about, you know, global warming. Yeah. It's like, I want the opinion of scientists. But in our society, we're like, well, let's get the opinion of the minister, the baker, and the candlestick maker, too. Yeah. And let's put, give them all equal weighting. Equal, equal weight. So you know, it's one of three or one of two. It either right. is true or not true. It's like, right. well... Maybe it's different causes, and, yeah, and maybe there's different right. effects, and, and maybe some people have extreme views, and sure, you have to, yeah, you have to find that signal through there, and who has time for that? Right. It's a lot easier to say, ah, it's BS, I read right. on the internet. Yeah, or, you know, like, or we think, oh, you know, we should have a consensus. If I'm in a room of 20 people, and I'm having a heart attack, and 19 of them are world-class cooks and bakers, and one of them is a cardiologist, I don't want a consensus. I want that one guy. <laughs> I want him to make a decision. I don't want equal weighting of everybody's opinion on how to treat me. It's like, that's, no. That's I a want, great point. I want the expert. Yeah. And that's, I think, like, even like when I watch the UFC, like, I appreciate Joe Rogan's insight. Not that he ever fought MMA, but he's a black belt in Taekwondo. He's a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He's an incredible comedian. And no yeah. yeah. And, you know, so when he talks about the fight and what somebody's doing wrong, you know, like, it's, it's, it's an intelligent insight based on a lifelong study that he's educated himself yeah. on. Where some of the other commentators that they bring in, like especially in the early UFCs, you'd, you'd listen to these guys and like, like I remember when Hoist Gracie triangled Dan Severin. They didn't even, the announcers had no idea what happened. Like, what, I, what did he tap for? You know, like yeah. they was as surprised as Severin was that he tapped. You know, like, it's like, oh, he's being choked, you know, but that's, I think that gets back to when he, when he what got, happened. When he got up, he was limping. Do you know right. why he was limping? Like what injury had, because he looked, he could mm -hmm. barely stand. His brothers right. were having to support him after that fight. Was that, I don't know. I remember they had to support him after the chemo fight. When Maybe he, I'm thinking the chemo fight. And, and I'm pretty sure he, he got a concussion chemo, from right. that. Yeah. Okay. And then um, he couldn't do the next fight. And based on all the symptoms, I think it was pretty clear. Like he had a concussion from okay. where chemo had hit him. You know, he's, he fought through it in arm him. And I remember watching Kimo go into the cage. He looked like he had just finished riding with Genghis Khan and mm -hmm. jumped off the Mongolian horde. And he's like, okay, I'm going to stop and beat this Brazilian guy. Mm -hmm. And he's really muscular. He's got that big ponytail. There was no USADA at right. the time. And he literally <laughs> was carrying a life-size wooden cross on his back to the cage. And I'm, I'm looking, and I'm like, hoist. You should get out of the cage right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> don't stay in the cage for this guy. Like, and even though I'd watched Hoist win the first two UFCs, I was like, you have never faced anything like this. Yeah. Get out of the cage. And then he somehow beats this guy. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I have got to learn what these guys are doing. Yeah. This is crazy. Yeah. Like, I wish I had that aha moment, you know, when I was watching it. For, for me, it wasn't until... Um, I've wanted to do it for a while. It's funny enough that you mentioned Joe Rogan because I started listening to his podcast right. and, you know, they talk about jujitsu every once in a while and I'm like, yeah, you know what? I have seen a lot of the jujitsu and yeah, right. this does sound like pretty good and interesting. And then I drove by Gracie Baja here in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. Just, right. it's on my, it's on my right. route. And we dropped in there and um, I was thinking about my son and mm -hmm. wanting to, to basically give my son. Right. So, so for me, I distinctly remember being a kid right. and getting in fights and having a kid sitting right on top of me, sure. 
you know, fortunately there was a teacher coming, so he wasn't mm -hmm. raining down punches right. on me, but sitting on top of me, and I didn't know what to do. I Absolutely. didn't know how to get out yeah. under. And so many times as a kid where it's just you accepted bullying as just right. part of like, hey, it's okay, because I didn't know how to fight, and I was small. Yeah. And I was like, you know, I have the opportunity. We've done okay for ourselves. I can put my son in a position mm -hmm. Where he never has to worry about right. that, you know. If if he if he decides to back out from a fight, it's because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. It's verbal jujitsu, right? right? Mm -hmm. It's um, he's 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 kind of uh, reducing the tension, uh, but he can also he can also take care of himself. Right. And so I walked in there and signed him up, and then you know I really just wanted to do it myself. Right? Sure. I mean, so, yeah. so the very first like family day or whatever, I got to put a gi mm -hmm. on. I'm just like I'm I'm doing it. I'm signing. Yeah, up. Done. that's awesome. Closed, done. Right. You know, and then. I proceeded to have Professor Fabiana, who's about 130, 135 pounds, sure. female. Um, I'm a wrestler. I used right. to wrestle in high school. Right. I can handle myself. Absolutely. Okay. I got yeah. pace. I'll probably take right. her down. You know, um, we'll see how it goes. And you know, uh, she was kind enough when it was over to say, "You have good base." Right. But that was after tapping me probably sure. 10, 12 times yeah. at leisure. Right. Right. And then in hindsight, you go, I did OK. Right. But, uh, you know, now knowing her, it's like, wow, she was so kind to me. Exactly. She was yeah. so gentle. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> like you could have killed me like a baby. Honestly, you are so lucky to be able to train with Fabiana Borges. I mean, like like when we moved here from Jacksonville, Florida, you know, like we didn't, you know, know a lot about San Antonio, although we lived here in 2008, 2009 because the Navy had me here for two years. But, you know. The jiu-jitsu scene had changed, and like I remember Googling, you know, where are all the schools in San Antonio? And I saw they was all on the north and the west side, so I was yeah. like, oh, well, we'll just open on the east side. You know, and at first we're like, well, what do they know that we don't? Why is nobody on the east? There was like 20 in the northwest corridor, yeah. but nobody was on the east. I'm like, and you know, nobody was on the south either. But I was like, the South is a more of an industrial area, but the East is a lot of neighborhoods. I'm yeah. like, we're going to try here. But I remember, you know, I was like, who is in San Antonio, you know, that I would know? Mm -hmm. And I was like, Fabiana Borges, multiple time female black belt world champion. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Or, you know, the Panero brothers. I've watched Rodrigo and Daniel train, you know, compete for years. Yeah. Monsters, like incredible practitioners. Or Diego Gaminol. I mean, an incredibly talented group of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioners here in town, or Bruno Alves. Like, mm -hmm. Long before I ever knew Bruno, Bruno had refed matches of mine in the IBJJF, and I'd watch Bruno compete. That's where I'd always seen yeah. him, too. I'm just like, oh, wait, right. that ref has a yeah. school. Yeah, like, right. <laughs> and he's coming in new. I'd never yeah. seen him compete. He's like, phenomenal. Oh, cool. And uh, But like, for women in Jiu-Jitsu, I think like they are the are the easiest to teach jujitsu women and small guys because like unlike me or you like they don't get to cheat with their athleticism yeah. they don't get to say well you know what i'm about tired of being in side control let me just bench press this person off me you know like that was hard to get past for the woman she or the you know the really small frail guy he's got to get that technique perfect and so like i had, I had a guy he was a student 400 pounds and he looked Easily, a, a, he was probably like a college football player, defensive okay. lineman, offensive lineman. He wasn't 400 Still pounds of blob, you yeah. know, like he carried a lot of fat on him, but he, yeah. he was a big, strong dude. And um, so Mike Fowler was at my school, and uh, the guy wanted to do a tournament. He'd only been training for a little while. And uh, Mike's like, well, let me show you one of these um, moves. I think it's a half guard sweeper, something he was going to show him. Mm -hmm. And the guy's like, no, no. I just want to learn top game stuff because that's where I'm staying. And when he rolled, you know, he would stay on top. And when a 400 pound guy yeah. is on top, yeah. you know, it's like even for colored he's belts, not right. he's, he's a big boy. It's yeah. tough, you, don't you know, want to, be on the to sweep the guy or to, um, yeah. you know, do a lot with him. So that gives that gave him a false sense of confidence. But what he didn't realize is when he went to the tournament, you weren't going against a 150 pound guy. You was going to go against another guy who might be three or four hundred pounds. Yeah. You know, and what happened? He ended up on the ground and on the bottom. Yeah. And then I think he just tapped from the pressure. Wow. And like, I mean, when he was on top, he was a world beater. But as soon as he got swept, what but, an eye-opening experience. Right. But it was hard to teach a, 
a man that's that big and strong jujitsu because it's like, why would I go on the bottom? Why would I go on my back? That's that's yeah. silly. Nobody's and, ever put him on. Screen. Right. Yeah. And when I'm when he's rolling in here, he's always on top, you know, because 400 pounds is a lot to sweep. Yeah. And that's I mean, it's a problem. Especially in a gi. Sure. And um, they get grips on top. It's slow and friction. Yeah. So when you're trying to teach a big, strong guy, it's jujitsu. It's so much harder. Yeah. You know, like if a guy comes in at 300 pounds and he's, you know, big and strong, I know, man, it's, it's going to be hard to teach him jujitsu. You know, but if a guy comes in at 100, I got a guy, he's 115 pounds, soaking wet. We call him uh, Sneaky Pete. He comes in and, um, you know, of course, every move, he's got to get it perfect. And he's a student of the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, he will catch and surprise you. And he's also a judo black belt. So that's, I think, how we got Sneaky Pete because it's like, Oh, you're rolling with him. He's a white belt. And yeah. it's like, all of a sudden, you started on your feet, and he just introduced you to the ground in a very violent way. It's like, <laughs> you must know something. Yeah. And uh, he, but for him to get a technique in jiu-jitsu, it's got to be perfect. It's got to be on point. It can't be like, ah, I've got it 80% right, and I'm just going to power through them at 20. And so that's why I think it's so cool about you see? training with Fabian. He's a blue belt now. Blue belt, okay. Is, yeah, you know, I always I always say that the the, the the small purple belts are the most sure. the scariest in the oh, world man. to me. You don't you and don't get there, you know, the easy way. No, it's you like you you had to there. grind. You had to take a lot of taps. You know, because yeah. when you're a small you know white belt, you know you're gonna you're gonna tap a lot. You know, and even maybe as a blue belt, you know, there'll still be white belt athletes that are coming in and gonna tap you. Mm -hmm. You know, that are just bigger and stronger and more athletic than you. And then, you know, once they start to get the purple belt, well, it's a whole new world because it's like this guy has really fine-tuned his technique yeah. and you're not catching him no more. And, um, you know, so like when you, like you training with Fabiana, you know, she had to go from white belt to black belt perfecting the technique. So there's no doubt in my mind, like when she teaches it, it's like, it's, it's going to be so much more technical. Yeah. And so like, you know, I've trained with like Hanet Stack or Letitia Hibero, and it's the same thing, or Val Worthington, where high level female black belts, you know, who could not use athleticism because they're rolling with men who are bigger and stronger than them. Mm -hmm. And, but when they teach fine details of a technique, it's details that a lot of times I don't even think about, or, you know, had never learned from, you know, bigger, stronger male practitioners because we didn't have to perfect it that yeah. well. And so like, yeah, I, and when I see students come out of, you know, your school, they're phenomenal, you know, in competition. And I think it's because their technique is so, so on point yeah. and it's a tribute to your instructor. Well, I would imagine, I mean, you as well, though, it's, um, I imagine your efficiency is on point as well. And that's huh. going to force technique, right? I mean, because yeah. you don't, I think there's something to be said. I mean, so, so you remember for you, it's still fresh coming up mm -hmm. through the ranks. It's not like you were right. 17, 19, and that's when you first learned how to do an arm bar, right. and you barely remember how to teach an arm mm -hmm. bar because you don't remember when you acquired it. Sure. You do remember right. when you acquired yeah. your first arm bar. And, probably and who you taught me? Your yeah. Bar. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, so for you, I mean, for you, it's like, you know, coming in at a, at a, at a more mature age, um, just as me, I think the mm. first first time I put the gi on, it's thirty seven or thirty eight. Right. So, um, you know, you, you're you're going to remember as a white belt when suddenly you realized, oh hey, as I go back for the arm bar, like I should already be squeezing or I should be reaching for the leg. Yeah. I should be these right. little additional things that now you're teaching and your mm -hmm. students are going to go, Pow, sure, right? Because you're able to say, hey, I, I, I know right. what I did there, and, and let me let me help you on your journey faster. And teaching is like so much. You learn so much by teaching because there were so many of the techniques, you know, before I started teaching that I just did from muscle memory. Like I learned them. I just did them for years. And it's like, OK, I'm I'm getting ready to hip bump sweep you. And I just do it. But when you teach it, you have to explain where your hand goes. And sometimes people are like, well, what, on step three, where does my hand go? And I'm like, hold on, let me do this. And then as I start to do it, it's like, OK, your hand is right here. Like. Yeah. Grab the tricep, yeah. you know, where it's like, because it's muscle memory, I don't think about where it goes. But when you go to teach it, you've got to break it down. And then there's somebody who's going to want to know, well, why does that work? Or why do you put your hand there or there? And um, it made me understand the techniques at such a deeper level. 
and really improve my jiu-jitsu. Do you, do you think that also, um, you know, being, being an adult learner, um, you internalize the concepts more? So, like, so there's certain concepts, I guess, just to, like, lead the question in, um, certain concepts like creating distance to escape, mm-hmm. closing distance, you know, on top, and, and there's, you know, um, uh, maintaining points of contact, you know, uh, uh, putting framing and removing frames, and there's those concepts that, you know, for example, like my son, you know, he's, he's learning, and so we'll, I'll teach him, you know, a double leg, and right. um, he does... You know, he's seven. He doesn't offer sure. a double leg. Yeah. He doesn't understand conceptually right. like how he's supposed to be moving his body and and driving and you know controlling the hips and removing the the posts and mm-hmm. he doesn't understand it conceptually. But as an adult, when you learn a double leg, you're doing it and you're gonna you're stopping and you're thinking, well, why does this work? Sure. Right. You're gonna break down. And so that's the other thing I'm kind of I'm wondering. I mean, is that something that have you noticed that mm-hmm. in terms of, of younger learners versus yeah, like adult learners? Some you know. Some people are more inquisitive on why does it work. And then one of my challenges is like, especially amongst the white belts, it's like, okay, well, what's the counter to this? It's like, no, I want you to focus on yeah, you making this work it. first. Because, yeah. <laughs> you know, I have to explain to them, I'm like, there's a counter for everything. There's no, like, you know, my favorite martial arts movie of all time was The Karate Kid. And uh, Mr. Miyagi's on the beach, and he's doing what we end up finding out it's called the crane kick. Mm-hmm. And Daniel asked him, you know, what was that, Mr. Miyagi? And he's like, it's the crane kick. You know, if it's done correct, no defense for it. <laughs> Which was proved wrong in Karate Kid 2 because the kid from Okinawa defended it just fine and busted <laughs> Daniel's nose afterwards. But in jiu-jitsu, there's no, there's no magical move like that. There's no, yeah. if I do this move, there's nothing you can do to defend it. Yeah. Oh, there's there's a counter for it. It's just whether you know the counter, or whether you can identify the counter in yeah. time. Yeah. I know. To to prevent it, you know, like everybody, well, most people in jujitsu know a counter for the sister sweep, but like I was rolling with Nate Diaz a couple years ago, and he sister sweep. True me. story. Yeah. That's awesome. We're rolling, and um, <laughs> we're both I, in the game. I was rolling with Nate yeah. Diaz, and. and that's and a great beginning of any story. Boom! He scissor sweep me. And I'm like, wow, I haven't been scissor sweeped in a long time. Yeah. You know, because I'm pretty good at countering it. He's also but been a black his belt efficiency a long time. was so good. Like, he hit it right now. And it was the same thing like when I competed against Megaton Diaz. It wasn't that he did any moves that I'd never seen before, it was his efficiency in the speed and decisiveness to where he got it. Yeah. From point A to point B, there was no pause. It was just like, bam, let's go. And, um, you know, so I tell my guys, I'm like, if you watch me against Megaton, Megaton passed my guard. It's not that I don't know how to stop people from passing my guard. You know? <laughs> You're a you know? I could. If I could, I would. Yeah. You know, Megaton got me in side control. It's not that I don't know how to escape side control, but shortly after that, he had knee on belly. And then Megaton went to mount. It's not that I don't know how to stop somebody from going from neon belly to mount or from side control to mount. It's just that that was the transition. I ended up escaping mount, but you know, it was like he was doing things, nothing that was I'd never seen before. Yeah. Nothing that I didn't know accounted for. Yeah. But the decisiveness of which he did each move, there was no pause. It was just like boom, we're right into this. Because I remember like he went for a toehold. And I defended it. Then he went for a knee bar. And I defended it. And then he just stepped out and passed my guard. Mm. You know, like he'd, he'd done three different attacks. And then he got the guard pass. Mm. I was like, and all I'm doing is I'm just responding. Yeah. You know, he was on offense the whole time. I was on defense the whole time. So what's, what's that quote? Like if you, if you're, if you're, you think you're late or something like that? You're late, yeah. yeah. Salah Habero said it, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, Who ironically I got my purple belt from. Oh, cool. Yeah, because your military journey is every yeah. every three years you move to a new place. That's one so, of the saddest parts. We get we get so many great people coming through our right. school, and then they're off and gone. Oh yeah, it's hard. You, yeah. you follow them on Facebook, and right. they continue their journey elsewhere. Sure. But it's just like man, because they they say I, I read something the other day that says twenty percent of this belt is mine, the right. other eighty percent is my teammates. Sure, right? They're yeah. they're the ones that that kind of made you made right. you who you are, and vice versa. It's the give and take. 
and so you know it's a piece a piece of you and what made you right. then goes on somewhere else and that's that's kind of hard oh yeah that's you know as as an instructor you know here in san antonio you know it, it breaks my heart every time my military guys move because yeah. you know you're invested in them and you know that made my journey and my wife's journey so much different like i admire the guys who go from white belt to black belt with the same instructor it's like dude that is so cool but you know for, for me and my wife like almost every belt was from a different instructor mm. but the cool thing was we saw a lot of different ways of to looks. do stuff yeah, yeah like and that that's what makes like going to the the world championships or the pan am so freaking cool for us because it's almost like a family reunion because we're running into all these friends yeah. that we used to train with not to mention people we've competed against before but it's like oh you know, I used to train with you in North Carolina, or I used to train with you in South Carolina, or in Florida, or Texas, or in Illinois. It's like, and oh, I haven't seen you in years. This is so That's cool. Good, you, you. That's cool. Yeah, which is what makes those tournaments so cool for me. Can I ask you a question about sure. your school? Why did you rename it Semper Fortis? I know you were uh, Brazil Zero Two One, right. and, and um, I, I like I like the name. I'm, I right. know there's going to be yeah. a military, sure. you know, route, route right. to that, but. Um, and what was the thought process? What happened was, um, I w upon retiring, you know, I was getting ready for retirement, and like, um, like here in San Antonio, you've got Rodrigo Pinero, Daniel Pinero, Bruno Alves, um, Mahasinki, um, Fabiana Borges, um, you know, Diego Gaminol, these amazing jiu-jitsu practitioners from Brazil, and no matter how long I trained. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I'm never going to be more Brazilian than they are. You know? Got it. I can never be more Gracie than they are. Mm -hmm. But I did 33 years in the Navy. So I could be more military than anybody. Yeah. You know, it's like I've got 33 years of active yeah. duty service. That makes so sense. So Semper Fortis, you know, like most people are familiar with the Marine Corps' Latin motto of Semper Fidelis, which just means always faithful. And Semper Fortis just means always strong. And um, so my wife and I, we talked about it and we're like, you know, why don't we, you know, make, change the school name as a tribute to your military service? And I was like, ah, that sounds pretty cool. So now, you know, our school emblem, we got a Navy anchor and it's like Semper it. Fortis, you know, the Navy Latin motto. And, um, and I, I joke with all my army guys. I'm like, yeah, we got you wearing Navy stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so they appreciate the banter. And so that, that's what, help with the transition and you know it's like I can't be more Brazilian than the Brazilians but mm -hmm. I can be more military than almost anybody yeah and um, that makes so, sense it's it's uh, it's your your desire to be genuine right and to play know? to what our strengths were you yeah. know because we would meet students they would come in prospective students and they're like oh so you're from Brazil and it's like no I visited Brazil but no I'm, you know not I from how that'd be an awkward kind of first sure. introduction or right. first introduction um, where I mean, you you have your own story. You don't. So why were you using Brazilian two zero two one? Was that right. a, was that an affiliation? Mm -hmm. type of thing? It was an affiliation, okay. just like um, Gracie Baja is, okay. and it's headed up by Andre Terencio and Hanette Stack. Yeah. Um, wonderful people, and um, but you know we had decided we would go with our own name, yeah. and you know because Brazil zero two one all all it meant was zero two one is the area code for uh, Rio de Janeiro. Yeah. You know, so it's sort of like here in San Antonio, people are like two one zero. What's well, the know? same thing with like Gracie yeah. Baja? Like sure. Gracie, Gracie Baja, Baja was the name. Like that's the location. Of the yeah, school. I've been to that neighborhood yeah. in Rio. So yeah, it's like it's kind of like saying like Gracie San Antonio, Austin. Gracie right. San Antonio. Houston. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but you got it. You got it. Right. The brand you built the brand mm -hmm. to a certain extent. You got to own it. And so we we started building the Semper Fortis brand. And the other thing that we felt like is um, you know like. The business of running a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu school, I think where most schools go wrong, is they think, you know, it's more important to prove that my Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is better than the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu at your school or the other schools in town. But the business is the prospective white belt. The person that doesn't even know there's a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu World Championships. You know, all they know is like, I saw some Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu maybe in the UFC, um, Sometimes they come in, they're like, do you guys break boards? You know, because they think of karate. Yeah. Um, you know, they want to learn some self-defense. But they have no idea that there's a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu World Championships, mm -hmm. let alone who might have won it, mm -hmm. you know. 
but what they consider excellence is like, oh, well, oh, you got a black belt. So I know black belt means, you know, you're an expert, you know. Yeah. So like they outside of that, it is right. sure, yeah. you know, so outside of that, like there's no advantage in trying to prove that my school is better than somebody else's school, mm -hmm. you know, because that's that's not worth my marketing dollars mm -hmm. to say, oh, uh, well, maybe I can get a few students from your school to come over to my school, you know. It's like, that's yeah, a horrible way to yeah exactly. Yeah. You know, where the reality is, and I've met people who are like, oh, you know, the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu market is flooded in San Antonio. There's maybe 25, those give or people, take schools. Those people are, right. everything's going to always sure. be flooded. Right, but the deal is, half empty. is, um, San Antonio and the surrounding area has over two million people. Yeah, and Tell you know, me, yeah. and, all, all all two million of them, yeah. they know right. They know about the schools that you that you think right. about. And um, like of those two million people, I was joking with um, Mahasinki Sergio Correa, and he uh, was like, "How many people do you think do jujitsu in San Antonio?" And um, I said, 10,000 amongst the twenty-five schools." And he's like, "You're being way too generous." You are. It's like. It's probably more like 5,000, maybe less. Yeah. So if you think 2 million people in the surrounding area of San Antonio. Well, assume, and, assume each of those schools has, has a couple hundred students. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. So the numbers aren't there. Yeah. But so let's say each school had 1,000 students. So there's 25 schools. Each school has 1,000 students, which would be 25 of the most successful schools in the world. Yeah. All here in San Antonio. Yeah. That still leaves over 1.9 million people to bring the message of jujitsu to. You know, like the market is not flooded. Mm -hmm. But if you're not a good businessman, no matter what the market's doing, you're not gonna do well. Yeah. It's sort of like the stock market. Like even when the stock market is going through a rut, there's businesses that excel. Yeah. Even in a bad economy. And in a great Especially economy. Especially in a bad economy. Yeah. Because they're they're deep, right. they're deep with their right. customers. Sure. Doesn't matter how many customers you have, right. how many feel like they're right. a part of the tribe, like right. how many feel like they're a part of the culture. Those people aren't going anywhere. Right. The culture brings them back, if yeah. anything. When so they've got their blue belt and they ride off into the sunset and then they return, right? right? They're going to return yeah. because they, they miss their family. Right. But even in a great economy, businesses go under, you know. So in the best of times, like, you know, like we've been on since two thousand and eight. You know, the economy's been doing really well. Yeah. You know. But Toys R Us still went out of business. Yeah. You know, like, why did they go out of business? Is it because the economy was bad? No. So there was, there was other factors. Yeah. And it's the that. same thing with jiu-jitsu schools. It's like, there's people that struggle because they don't understand business. And they don't understand marketing. They don't understand customer relations. How do you treat people? Like, yeah. You know, like, I've, I've been to schools where, like, the instructor is very unprofessional. You know, I'm not talking about schools in San Antonio. I'm just in my jujitsu journey. I've had I've trained at a lot of schools. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been to schools where like, you know, male instructors sexually harass female students. They consider them like, oh, this is this is my dating pool. Mm. Well, you know, you know, that's gonna hurt your business. Yes. You know, I've been to schools where like, they are very cultish. Um, you know, like, oh, if you left this school, you're no longer allowed to talk to this guy because he left our. You know, he left our group. That's always unfortunate. And it's like, hold on, if you're paying me to teach you, I'm providing you a service, yeah. I don't get to tell you, like, who you associate with outside of the school. It's easy to forget yeah. that students are our customers. Right. Sure, right? yeah. This isn't, this isn't like old school right. Japan, you know, yeah. my, my school against your school. If I treat you badly, you know, like, Americans won't put up with that crap. No. They're like, oh, no, like, like, I don't know how your boss is, but you know, like there's some years where like in the military, my boss was a sh straight jerk. So I had to put up with a jerk to earn my dollars. I don't want to take those dollars that I earned putting up with this jerk and give it to another jerk to be a jerk to me. You're like, I already got treated crap once yeah. to earn this dollar. I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to pay you to treat me like crap. That's a great way to put yeah, it. Yeah. Like, yeah. And you know, so some guys, they miss the boat on that. Like they either, they waste money on marketing to other students at other schools, which is, even if you get those guys, like it's, they may, they're not longevity, you know, or, you know, they mistreat their students or they sleep with their students. You know, they do things that create an atmosphere that 
causes people to walk out the door. The truth, the truth is, is I mean, if I if I took a, a, a quick survey, I'd say eighty to ninety percent of all the students that that um, train out of school is because they are within five to ten miles right. of that school. Yeah. I mean, um, I agree. I, I got very fortunate, you know, in the school I belong to, um, but I was also it was the sign that I saw sure. as I was driving by. Right. You know, and that's true, and it's true for for probably a lot of the students yeah. there now. If I'm if I'm moving to town right. and I'm a purple belt, and I'm I might be shopping schools. Sure, you know where can I teach a right. little bit? Mm -hmm. Like who do I who who what black belt matches my body style? Who right. can I train under? Like I'm going to analyze those things. Um, but if you're running a good program, you're going to raise up your own yeah. higher belts. Right. You're going to build higher belts. Right. Like you said, the, the businesses in the white belts because yeah. they're the ones that are only discovering jujitsu. And them, it's going to be, you know, where right. are they located? It's going to be, how are you, in, first of all, that first introduction, report, sure. quick yeah. report. Do you treat them well? Is your school clean? Right. Is, are the other students right. kind to them? Do they understand they're yeah. beginning their journey? Mm -hmm. Their first introduction. Um, and I honestly, like, I think I think every brand new student, and, and you can tell me if this, this holds water or not. I think every brand new student should start with a private. Mm -hmm. And I know that's not easy to yeah. do because they're going to want to, right. you know, even if it's a free private, mm -hmm. even if it's a private, the, the regular class is going right. on and a coach yeah. is like, hey, right. here's how you break fall. Mm -hmm. Here's how right. you break somebody's grip. Like, it's just very, very, here's how you get out of mount. Here's right. a quick escape. Um, two, two reasons. One, um, if they decide not to sign up, mm -hmm. but somehow in their lives, that little bit of jujitsu that yeah. they picked up saves their lives or helps them. Right. Then that's that's just that's just being a good human. Yeah, right? absolutely. Giving them that skill sure. of like, here's how I break right. somebody's grip when they're trying to pull me away. Right. Um, second is um, there's the law of reciprocity, mm -hmm. and you've given them something. Right. Now they feel loyal to to give back, and by yeah. give back, that's their time and energy. Sure. And they end up getting right. a whole they get a superpower in exchange for it. Yeah. But right. to me, that seems like the like the best way to to onboard. You know, I, somebody, I, cause I, feel, I agree. I feel gratitude yeah. towards Professor Fabi because not this is one reason, but you know she was just starting her school when I started. Right. Like I was one of her very first students, um, at least at, at this school. Yeah. And so I got so much one on one right. time that um, I I just I see the value in that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, like you know, like it's it's you know investing into this, your students is just an invaluable. Um, it's it's just so worth your time. Like I, yeah. like for me, what I do, and a lot of people think I'm silly doing it. Is one, I don't do contracts. I don't. If you don't want to train at my school, I don't want you to buy me out of a contract. I just, you know, you just don't pay next month, and you know, go train someplace else. And I'm cool with that because sometimes I get students, you know, like I get students who are like, hey, you know, I want to I want to be an MMA fighter. I'm like, okay, I'm not. That's cool, but I'm not the place for you because I'm teaching gi jiu-jitsu six days a week. One day a week, I teach no gi. I have no striking classes. If you want to be an MMA fighter here in San Antonio, I think you're best off going to Ohana mm -hmm. or Rodrigo Pineros. There's other places that they've got Muay Thai that can do. Yeah, yeah, but I think or UFC gym. I guess. Yeah, I mean, I don't Ohana and Rodrigo, I think have the two best in town as far as MMA programs. Of course, somebody could listen to this podcast and be like, oh, you know, we do fine at our school too. And I'm sure you do. But my professional opinion, that's who I send up to. I'm like, yeah. oh, you want to be an MMA fighter? I think based on, if you live on the west side, I think you should go to Rodrigo Pinero School. If you live on the east side, north side, I think you should go to Ohana. I think they both have great programs. Um, and I, But I give everybody a one-month free trial. And there's no contracts. And there's, there's, no, there's no hidden fee. Because I even loan you a gi. And people are like, how can you afford to give up a free month? It doesn't cost me anything. Because my costs are sunk in business. Like, mm -hmm. my rent for my location is 3000 bucks a month. Whether I have one student or whether I have 1,000 students, my landlord wants his $3,000 mm -hmm. on the first of every month. That's, that's a sunk cost. You know, like, my mats are already paid for. You know, the electricity is going to be on, and I'm running AC, whether I have one student or 100 students yeah, in class. Yeah, cool in the same amount of air. You know, so I'm not losing anything. If anything, by, it gets more expensive with right. more students, all those hot yeah. bodies. But, you know, for the, 
for the large part, I haven't lost anything. Mm -hmm. And the person comes in and he tries it for a month and gets a feel for whether like this is really them. Like very rarely does somebody actually train with me for an entire month and then just not come back or sign up. I couldn't imagine. But, you know, I have people come in, try one or two classes, and then I don't see them no more. But for me, it's like, I want people to feel like, hey, I'm not trying, I'm not trapping you. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't want you to, you're not meeting a salesman, you're meeting me or Sway. There's no contract to sign. And Sway and I had a bad feel on contracts because we had moved to North Carolina and we signed a contract at a gym and we just, they was the only gym in town. And then, you know, within a month we realized the dude was like, the dude was off. Like, and we're like, no, we can't be in this. Mm. And, and another gym opened up and it happened to be opened up by my best friend. I just didn't know he was opening up a gym and that he was moving to North Carolina. Well, he was one of my best friends. You know, apparently we weren't that close yeah, that I knew yeah, he was yeah, opening yeah, up yeah. a gym. Yeah, he grabbed beers recently. And um, so I was like, well, I'm gonna honor my contract and I'm just gonna train at both places. And the guy was like, no, you can't train at both places. And I'm like, one of those. I'm like, well, why can't I? And he said, well, for example, Washington Redskin players don't train with Dallas Cowboy players. Oh, I hate that and I said, me. I said, well, there's a difference. Yeah. Daniel Snyder pays Washington Redskin players to do what he tells them to do. <laughs> I'm paying you. So you don't get to tell me like what I do and who I train with. Yes. You know, like for me, like, like I've trained at most of my friends' schools in San Antonio. You know, I've, I've trained with Daniel Pinero. I go up and train with Delua and New Braunfels, you know. I've been to Ohana and trained, you know. If people welcome me, I go in, I've gone up to the Seguin Training Center and I've had those guys come in and train at my school. They're black belts. Um, and um, it makes my school better, it makes them you better. I a variety of yeah. people. It and does nothing but make you better. Because to me in Jiu-Jitsu, we're all kindred spirits. Yeah. It's like, whatever rivalries existed in Brazil or someplace else, those aren't my rivalries. Like, I've gone to my high school a couple times for his seminars. Like. Dude, it's an amazing teacher. And it's like, yeah, I'm gonna go over there and train. You know, if I'm, if people are cool with me coming over, I'll come over. Yeah. Or if they want to come over and train with me, I don't want you to switch schools. Plus you avoid you know? building yeah. your own kind of fife to right. your own echo chamber right. where it's like, no, we do it this way because right. you're, you're venturing out and yeah, you've trained a lot of schools, but yeah. we're all students. Right. And plus I think I look at people that do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as kindred spirits. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, like, you train at Gracie Baja, I train at Semper Fortis, but we're both similar souls. You know, like, you know, you do what you do in life, you have your family, and then you go and you, you yeah. choke some of your closest friends and family yeah. members, or you try to prevent them from choking you. Yes. And, you know, that's a, to me, we have so much more in common than we have not in common. And it's like, why would I not want to train with my friends? I think it's, it's the same thing as, um is you recognize somebody who who you know has the character to persevere through a very difficult challenge right. like you you know you know that somebody once they reach a certain level uh, in jiu-jitsu that they have just a certain strength to them and um, you know I, I I mean they always say that jiu-jitsu filters for for a holes right sure and yeah. sure some some get through it's yeah, some persevere <laughs> you, hear, you hear some navy seals talk about it too yeah. they're just like you know you're talking about like like a, like a a a group of alphas, like mm -hmm. extreme personalities. Right. But even that's still sorted too. You mm -hmm. have the seals that you're just like, I don't know how that seal made it through training. Sure. Yeah. And then you have your elite seals Absolutely. that everybody looks up yeah. to. Yeah. And so same thing in jujitsu. But for the most part, like you know, you know that you they've already survived a certain sorting right. mechanism that allowed them to say like, mm -hmm. oh well, I train. Yeah. I mean, just 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 getting the like the third stripe on the white belt. Um, the difference that right. you see between day one, and I'm not saying the white belt isn't an amazing person, but sure. they haven't gone through the filtering process right. where you're just like, wow, this, this, this person is, is able to persevere through a real challenge yeah. physically, mentally, and keep returning. Right. Um, and you see, you see such a big difference. For me, the, my favorite thing to watch is, is a white belt learn to chill. Yeah. You know, right. all of a sudden you see that switch go off right. where you just, it's, it's almost nice you know, the, them rolling with, with, with women and children or people that are smaller than mm -hmm. them too because suddenly they realize it's like, oh, 
this isn't about trying to fight for my life and kill this person, yeah. you know, and all of a sudden their arms relax a little bit, you know, and it's no longer just the right. death grip. So, yeah, yeah it's, it forges character. And, and, you know, the other thing I look at the cross training is like, you know, like we're in a military town. Like if me and let's say a friend of mine who trains at another school, if we both went to Iraq and we fought the enemy together and then we come back or and then, you know, later on, we're going to go to Afghanistan. We're going to fight the enemy together. And then we come back. How can I go fight the enemy with you? But yet, the sacred jiu-jitsu, you're on a different team. Mm -hmm. You know, we're on the same team when we go to war. You know, yeah. but, you know, there's, there's a rivalry between, you know, your association and my association. We've already talked about yeah. our Army, Navy, right. Marines, yeah. Air Force. I right. mean, there's rivalry there, too. You're fighting on the same side. Right. And it's like, I, I think, like, you should, you should train with who you want to train with. Enjoy, you know, what you're yeah. doing. And um, I'm just totally against, uh, oh, no, I'm, I'm only going to train with people on my team, you know. Because, you know, well, what if they take my secrets and, you know, That's enter into a tournament? That's it's what like, we're talking about. Yeah. There's no secrets. Right. Yeah. It's like <laughs> if I do a move in a tournament, somebody's videoed it's it. It's out there. And it's out there. Yeah. And, then, and then it'd be different That's if it was like if, like, if members of my school were – having to go to a tournament. Like, I think we got a tournament next weekend. If the tournament was for fight to the death, then I'd be a little leery of training, you yes. know, cross-training yes. members at your school. Be like, yes. well, no, you know, like, yeah. you know, my buddy Bob might die in this fight to the death yeah, next week. Yeah, serious consequences. But the only consequence is my buddy Bob might not get a cheap medal, you know, at but, the next tournament. But we'll get better in the process. Yeah, right. Because, okay, he got swept, and maybe it was a sweep that he learned from me that your opponent did. Yeah. What's been lost? Nothing. But like you huh. said, there's a counter to everything. Right. So sure. at that point, it's like, you know, Bob Bob got an incredible lesson. Sure. Yeah. Know? And he'll get better. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah so I'm just not for these school rivalries, and you know, I think. And, like, so the schools in San Antonio, if you say, hey, you know, where would you train if you and Sway didn't have a, a school? That's a hard one because I would love to train with Fabiana Borges. I would love to train at Maha Sinkis. I would love to train at Ohana with Bruno Alves, or I think they got Danielson Pimenta over there now too. He's amazing. Rodrigo Pinero for sure. Um, love to train with him. Daniel Pinero, I've trained with him. He's amazing. One of my dearest friends, Josh Lauber, owns the Helsing Gracie School over on the west side. We would probably make the drive to go train with him, you know, but like there's, I don't look at any of those guys as my competition. Mm -hmm. I look at them as like, these are amazing jujitsu practitioners and there's 2 million people. When you said coming to our school yeah. to train, my heart just fluttered. So I'm just like, yeah. that would be, that would be amazing, you right. know, um, to have, uh, you know, a, a black belt like yourself to be able to, to train with you and, um, and yeah. learn, learn from you. That would be, that would be phenomenal. And, my wife you know, will be I at your school Sunday. Most people you know? feel that way, yeah. And, you know, because that's what I love about the girls and geese thing, although they exclude me, but, <laughs> you know, like... Well, there's surgeries that yeah. can get you in there you know, if you're I, very dedicated. They don't look at um, jiu-jitsu associations. They're like, you know, one girls and geese event yeah. in San Antonio was at my school. I know another one, you know, this time it's going to be at Gracie Bajas. Same thing submit the stigma, too. Yeah, you know, like... Same thing. You know, it's mission 22, right? Yeah, which is near and dear to my heart. You know, it's like, you know, what can we do to keep these veterans from committing suicide? Or like the veteran charity that I love the most is um, the We Defy Foundation. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I meant right. We Defy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I support both Mission sure, 22 sure, and sure, We Defy. Sure. But I knew you were um, in We Defy with yes. Mr. Brian Marvin. Right. Now he's Yes. Out. And um, they, you know, like the We Defy, like there's a lot of veterans charities out there. And like, um, you know, like for instance, the Wounded Warrior Foundation. I see their shirts all over the place, but in my 33 years in the Navy, I never met anybody that benefited from the Wounded Warrior Charity. Mm. I'm not saying that they don't benefit anybody. I just never met anybody, you know? And there's a lot of veterans charities that are in that category with me. But the We Defy, I know at least 10 people that are We Defy sponsored athletes, not just at my school. I have a couple at my school, but yeah. you know, like that are doing jujitsu they are combat injured veterans, you know, often case missing limbs. You know, I have a guy, half his body is paralyzed. And, you know, they were injured in combat 
and we the five is getting them into jujitsu. And if they weren't into jujitsu, like, you know, maybe they, maybe they'd be, you know, might commit suicide. Who knows? Like it just, you know, jujitsu is an outlet for them. And you know, like I have a guy, Domingo. He's amazing. He's missing his arm that he lost in an IED explosion in Iraq. And uh, he competes, like he's competing next weekend at the Samurai Cup. And he competed a couple weekends ago at the AGF. And um, he did really well. I, but like as a black belt, if I, if I was missing my arm, I would not be winning. I don't think I could beat anybody that I faced in the last Worlds or the last Pan Ams. So I admire him so much. I wonder sometimes if those guys have an advantage. When's the last time you well, you were different? But me, I've never fought a guy with one arm. Right. I, I honestly, I know where I would attack for the Kimura. Sure. I'll tell you what, that one good arm he's got, I bet right. that thing is power. Like, oh, yeah, I'm, sure. I'm not, yeah. not going to get it. It's a very strong arm. arm. And he's going to be protecting it the right. entire time and probably attacking me with it. Sure. Plus, his weight is going to be right. less, right? Mm-hmm. He's He's... He's missing a limb, sure. but he's gaining all right. that rest of that musculature. And sure. now his legs get more muscle mm-hmm. on them than mine because right. we're in the same weight bracket. Right. I mean, you see wrestlers with no legs winning. You know, oh, yeah. these are, they, 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 they're gigantic of yeah. the body and they're right. winning because sure. these other wrestlers they don't they can't match limb right. for limb. Yeah. and they've never, never fought somebody like that before. Sure, so I, there's some advantages to it, yeah. but you know, there's the huge disadvantage and it, and just the fact that he has the courage. You know, to come in and learn jujitsu, mm-hmm. and then step on the mats with people that have use of all four limbs, and give it his best. And you know, like, you know, and he yes. won a couple matches. It's like, you know, and like Joey Bozik, the founder of We Defy. My gosh, like we almost lost our minds a couple years ago. It was a, I think it was the Austin Open, and um, Joey is missing both legs, half of one arm. So he's got he's got one full arm. And he, he caught this dude in a wrist lock and tapped him out. It was like, oh my gosh. You know, like, that. I was so happy for him, but so happy for the organization and so happy for, like, veterans who, you know, seemed like they had no hope, you know, from these horrible combat injuries. Yeah. And it's like, no, dude, the president of the We Defy Foundation just stepped on the mat, you know, with only one full limb and beat a blue belt. In a, and I, I don't know how, many, how long it took, but he won that freaking match. Yeah. And um, I think, and I might be misspeaking, but I believe it was the first match Joey had ever won in jiu-jitsu. You know, so... That's got to feel great. That was, it was incredible. You know, and that, to me, it's so inspirational. Yeah. And, and that's, that inspires me. And that's, that's what I love about jiu-jitsu. I was going to say, I, I was going to say, those are the stories that I, I love to hear. Because we've got, you know, we've got people at, at Gracie Baja, it's the same thing. In fact, right. Jay, who I had on the podcast, has mm-hmm. had so many surgeries through his body right. that just, you know, it's like life hurts. Yeah. You know, but he's on the mat. And even right. though that hurts, and he's got to build his life around it. I mean, right. you know, kind of there's some pregame that goes into it and then some post-training, you mm-hmm. know, work that he's got to do. He, many ways he builds his day around it but it's um it's actually healed him in many right. ways too right it appear just as much as physically yeah. um you know he was in a, a deep state of depression he talked about it on the podcast that just now to have that community mm-hmm. and um and then have a physical outlet to feel like you know not excluding ladies but just to feel like a man again right like yeah. when he was injured he didn't feel like a man he'd, he'd lost his uh autonomy sure and um his caretaker who's his wife you know she's she's literally getting him dressed right and you know now his his ability to move and you know he still gets help but uh, he's a different man than, right. than he was leading up to it and just the goal of knowing mm-hmm. he wanted to get on the mat right. and yeah. then forced him to lose a bunch of weight right. and get off some of his medication so we all That's need a awesome. battle to fight yeah like it just gives him a battle right. to fight and the same thing with these other gentlemen I, that was my takeaway from training um at your gym is you paired me up which I was honored, by the way. Um, you paired me up with a gentleman that um, he had some partial, um, he was partially paralyzed. Oh, Mike. So yeah. Mike's strong. Oh, my gosh. Like, oh. Yes. I was like, okay, this will be a fun. Ah. You know, there's a movie out about him. Really? Yeah, like, because he, he came in. This dude is incredible. Like, his name's Adam Emery. And he was shot by a sniper in Iraq um, in the head. And, you know, like, you know, 20 years ago, he just died in Iraq. Like, 
people didn't take injuries like that and survive. We're like now, you know, a medicine, military medicine is amazing. And guys who used to die in war are now coming back. You know, they're, they're severely injured, but they're coming back and they're coming back alive. Mm -hmm. And Mike came back and um, he, um, um, his wife had divorced him, you know, as he went through um, his recovery. She left him, she moved to Texas. And Mike's people from Georgia, Mike has nobody here in Texas. And um, Mike wanted to be close to his daughter. And he packed up and he moved to San Antonio just to be Good by man. his daughter. Like, he has no family here in Texas. And uh, so he was bringing his daughter to jiu-jitsu class. And then one day he's like, you think I can get on the mat and do this? And we're like, yeah, let's do this. Anybody can. And, uh, you know, Mike, Mike's been training with me for three years, and um, he entered the Dallas Open um, last year. Um, I promoted him to Blue Belt. He's, he's made so much progress. But yeah, the movie, it's called uh, Thank You for Your Service. Mm -hmm. And um, Mike didn't tell anybody he was doing the movie. And um, we didn't know because I call him Mike, but his name's Adam Emery. And, um, I was going to try to right. ask you about that. I was like, like he's called so, a Mike. Yeah, like, because when he signed up, you know, like, he signed up as Michael Emery. And so, you know, like, when you sign up, you know, I look at your name, mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, and I try to start calling you that. Do you have them put their names on their geese? No, no. no. I I'm just, like, I like I that. Just, it makes it a lot, it would make it a lot easier. Yeah. But no, I just, I, I, I try it's to hard, remember. It's hard to tell somebody what to do with their gi, especially sure. you're not, you don't do uniforms, right? No. And so no. it's, it's whatever gi. Yeah, whatever people want to wear. I'd love to wear a yeah. black gi. Sure. Um, it, it, great, it, I mean, that's a Gracie Baja right. thing. Yeah. Like, there's good, there's, there's good and bad in everything. Sure. Like, I understand the whole right. uniform thing. Um, but uh, I was checking to see if it was on. Uh -huh. Oh, nice. Not making sure. Um, I, uh, I like, I like, I like the, the, the fact that like, you know, it's it's consistent like it sure. is a bit of a team mm -hmm. in that you're wearing a uniform yeah. and you feel like you're part of the team even from day one but on the flip side you, you lose some of that personality sure. that you would otherwise be able to yeah. you know exercise just like any wearing regular clothes i would imagine you coming from the military um you could fall on either side where you're just like right. you know standard issue yeah. or right. you could be like Psh, yeah like no man be yourself right but but the name it to me it's important because you know, I'll come to class sometimes, and if it's not a class I usually attend, half the line is white belts I've never sure, met, right. and it's super awkward to like get somebody's name and uh -huh. I forget their name. And sure. They're saying goodbye, yeah. and I'm like, right. "Good roll, you. Right. Like, yeah. good, good job." Right. You know, it's really nice to to be able to say, "Hey, yeah. Aaron, right. good job," or "Hey, Mike, good job." Yeah, um, I try to remember everybody's name. It's it's hard, but you know, like um, but. It's funny because like some of the guys like who have never been in the military are like the most militant in running their schools. Where for me, like you come in with a tie dye gi, good to go, get on the mat, let's roll. Yeah. Like, you know, you can come in, you know, like there's a black belt in the area. Um, he loves, he's a big, big strong guy, Lynn Hughes. He loves to wear a pink gi. Dude, you want to come on my Love mat Lynn. with your pink Lynn's gi? Lynn's probably going to be one of the next yeah. the podcasts. Super yeah. guy, like... <laughs> Loves that pinky. Super dude. Yeah. Like, I remember watching him. character. I think it was in a fight to win a couple of years ago. And, like, I'd never I'd never heard of him. I'd never seen him before. And he was going up against another brown belt who I had seen compete before, who was really good. And, you know, I, I'm looking at this big guy come out in his pink gi. And I thought, you're about ready to get murdered. Because <laughs> the brown belt he was going against, I'd seen him compete several times in the IBJJF. And I'm like, yeah, I, I never heard of Len Hughes. He, you're about ready to get murdered. And uh, Lynn ended up, I think, put the dude to sleep. Mm. And I, I want to say it was a clock joke, clock joke from uh, the guy had turtled up. Oh. Nice. And I was so shocked. And I'm like, I'm going to go talk to this guy. This is crazy. <laughs> and then I found out, you know, he's a friend of mine, uh, Delua's student. And uh, I've known Delua yeah. since he taught in Virginia. He's a, and, he's a, um, he's somebody that I look up to because yeah. I've been able to follow his journey, uh -huh. um, with Sinister right. and, you know, from, from opening up the first, you know, he opened up in, in basically like a small kind of, you know, warehouse sure. area and it was really rough. And mm -hmm. he also took us in with, when right. Kit Dale came in to visit. Yeah. Very so we cool. did a seminar up there right. 
and you know they had just opened that weekend and yeah. he had some partners and I don't know what happened then but you know now it's like it's full on his school right. um, from from what it appears I might be I'm speaking out of turn sure. but it, it appears that way and to watch the inside of the school mm -hmm. like he drives Uber on the yeah. side you know just to make it to, yeah. to get it yeah right. to hustle and watching it from like here's a couple of students. Right. To here's a handful of students. To here's right. a good amount of students. And now there's you know Sin Fit his fitness program, yeah. and there's he's got full full suite of, of jujitsu classes. It's just like you know watching the guy um, grow his business mm -hmm. and just be that you know quintessential entrepreneur, right. yeah. whatever it takes. Sure, um, it's just something that's been it's been incredible to watch that journey. Yeah, I admire dudes like that. You know, because you know it's like he's he just works hard. You know, he's very secure about you know who he is, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, he's not letting the world fit him into a box, like, hey, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be this way, you should be this way. It's like, man, be who you are. Yeah. And, man, I love that about people. You know, like, there's so many cookie-cutter people, and so when I meet somebody that's, like, just unique, it's like, yeah, I know that's the kind of person I like. Yeah. You know, I admire guys like that. Yeah. And I admire Lynn Hughes. I think he'll be a great guest. And, yeah. I think so too. Yeah. I just have to get up to Austin. That's all. Sure. I hate yeah. to drive. Oh, I, I bet. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I try to avoid Austin. So, so we're we're at an hour fifty. Okay. And it cool. was the fastest hour fifty in my life. Very cool. Um, I, I got. I, I do have. I do have. I guess a question or some questions sure. around you and your business. Okay. Um, since we're I talking about growing book. gyms anyway, yeah. um, I know you are. I appreciate ah. that. Um, I'm I'm the same way because mm -hmm. I I'm also. It's you know a rising tide floats all right. boats. Yeah, I agree. And um, you you have to have an abundance mentality if you're going to be a business owner, or you're really going to ultimately mm. cost yourself opportunities. Sure. Yeah. Um, so you never know you never know what relationships you have right now mm -hmm. are going to turn into. If somebody else's business fails, now you have right. a new black belt instructor. Yeah, absolutely. Or um, you know if you want to like Semper Fortis, you want to open up a new location. Mm -hmm. Well, you know now you have a franchise. Right. And you just never know how it's going to yeah. grow. Um, and so that's, I want to ask you that question and then just to prepare you in advance, um, uh, it doesn't have to be like a formal closing statement, okay. but I'll, I'll, after that, I'll ask you if you have any kind of final words okay. towards, cool. towards literally right. anybody. But if I could, if I could craft it, I would say, do you have any final words towards, um, maybe some of your students that are mm -hmm. just beginning their journey or um, somebody who's who's just starting their own business mm -hmm. and kind of some thoughts around that. Huh. So just okay, to cool. help, sh help you shape it. Cool. Um, but the question I have around your business is um, how does one, so where do you see yourself in the next you know few years in mm -hmm. terms of growing your business and how do you see yourself getting right. there? Well, right now, like, because I turned 51 in, in November and so my my. What I've determined in talking with my wife, who's co-owner, I couldn't, I couldn't do this without her. She's amazing. Um, is I want to do this. I'm going to run this school until I'm 70. And then at 70, I'm going to reassess and be like, okay, do I want to keep running the day-to-day -day operations? Or do I want to, you know, pass this on to somebody? You know, because what I would love to do is pass it on to, like, I have kids that have been with me for three years. I would love to promote one of them to black belt and pass it on, you know, the school. Yeah. You know, like you run Semper Fortis, and you know it's not going to be my son because you know he's a police officer here in San Antonio, so he's doing his thing. Twenty years. My daughter. Never say never, yeah. Right? You know, my daughter. She's somewhat interested in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but so it, it may be like one of one of our students that's an adult, you know, that we pass this on to. But at least for the next 20 years, I want to do this. My goal is to do, you know, like when I talk to Elio Gracie's family members, they say he continued to do jiu-jitsu until he died at 95. And that's what I want to do. I don't know if I'm going to make it to 95, but however long I make it, I want to be able to do jiu-jitsu, you know, and just enjoy the mental stimulation because no matter what's going on in my day, you know, whether it's a good day, a bad day, when I'm rolling and I'm rolling with you, all I can think about is being in that moment with you. Because if I think about finances, if I think about, you know, education, whatever, you might choke me. You know? <laughs> or I get arm barred because I was thinking about something else besides the fact that a very good jiu-jitsu practitioner is trying to choke me right now or, you know, joint lock me. Mm -hmm. 
So I have to live in that moment, which is my meditation in jiu-jitsu. Is I'm living in the moment when I roll because all I can think about is the moment. Is I want to stop you from choking me. That was the first word yeah. came my, my mind, meditation, when you were talking about Oh, that. very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, That's cool. Um, so what are you... Do you have any final thoughts or, or um, inspiration or, or words for somebody who's think, beginning their journey in business or in jiu-jitsu? Is, you know, it's great for your health. It's great for your, um, the community of people that you get to know. Because you're going to know people that you wouldn't normally um, meet. You know, because I've got people who are doctors. I've got people who are police officers. Um, one of my police officers is like, hey, who is that guy? Because apparently... A blue belt came in and he had Mexican mafia tattoos. Oh and I'm like, well, I don't know if he's still active. And, you know, like, you know, I guess, you know, they need to train too. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, that's I get, inspiration for you to train. Right. You know, I get AC technicians, plumbers, just all walks of life that come in. And, but these are people that I wouldn't normally meet. Like, in my day to day business, like, if I wasn't doing jujitsu, I would never meet a lot of these people. And, a lot of these people are now lifelong friends, and they became friends because of jiu-jitsu. You know, so like some people in the military, like every three years they find a new church or they find a new social group to be a part of. Yeah. Where every three years when the military would move me, I found a new jiu-jitsu gym, and that became my new social network and for me and my wife. So jiu-jitsu, besides the health benefits of physical fitness, you know, which ties into you eating well, taking good care of your health. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's a lot of benefits. And then for me, it made my, my marriage stronger because I was doing jiu-jitsu first for three or four years. And then Sway decided, you know, you're spending too much time away from the family. You know, what are you doing? I should try this. And, and so she did. And like, I wouldn't be a black belt today if she hadn't started training because I was only training two or three times a week. Okay. And then when she started, it was like six days a week. And, you know, it became what was my personal time became family time. Yeah. And so like for me, it, it literally made my marriage better, you know? And I can't say that everybody that gets into jujitsu is gonna get that benefit. Like yeah. it's gonna make your marriage better. Start doing jujitsu, you know? Yeah. If your spouse starts doing jujitsu, I think it will, you know? But uh, if she doesn't or he doesn't, you know, depending on They certainly who understand comes in. your passion yeah. more when they're involved. Right. Yeah. And then you share it. Yeah. And, and it's, it's incredible advantages. And it just, um, you know, like, it's a good feeling for me or even for my son going to, you know, now that he's a police officer to know that, you know, if something happens physical, like you can, you can defend yourself, you know, you know, like that's, that's a nice comfort. Um, and then, you know, with me and my wife, when we go out, you know, it's like, I know she's got my back and I got her back, you know, like yeah. if something happens, you know, you know, we can protect ourselves. And I think, I think that's a nice way to live. You know, not that we're seeking fights, you know. No. I haven't been in a street fight since the 80s. Yeah. And, you know, but it's like, uh, it's it's nice comfort to know that, you know, if things go bad, you know, we we have options. You know, whether it's a verbal option or a physical option, we have options. Yeah. It's funny how the more you know, the less likely you are to get into yeah. a location. Oh, yeah, because, you know. Your ego is secure. Right. Sure. I mean, you don't need to. Yeah. And plus, you know, the people that I thought were tough before I learned Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, like big guys that look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, now it's little guys that look geeky like Ryan Hall or the Mendez brothers. Not that I'm saying Ryan Hall is a geek. I'm just saying, uh, sort of he's, look... He's a good <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Great guy, though. But, um, you know, like, but now when I look at guys that maybe, like, in the 80s or 90s, I'd be like, oh, I'd smoke this guy. Like, he... He wouldn't last a minute. I'm like, no, I don't think I, no, well, those three that I just named, I would not be, you know, that, these guys are phenomenal. Yeah. But when you look at them, you know, there's no affliction shirt or UFC shirt. They're just, you know, they might be dressed like me and you, just regular, like, oh, yeah. polo and shorts, sandals. And it's like, oh, yeah, but this guy yeah. really knows something. Yeah, you have perspective. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, hey, thank you so much for Man, being on. thank honor. you. It is an incredible again. honor. I appreciate Shoot. it. No, the honor's Man. mine. I enjoyed the conversation. Like I said, it's we're going on two hours, and it was oh, wow. really, really fast. Very cool. So, yeah. I didn't I didn't realize I'd ran my mouth that long. No. <laughs> it's a conversation. It was a lot of fun. Thank Shoot. you. 
Thanks for listening to the podcast. Hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. As always, please like, please subscribe, please share it with your friends. Thanks so much for listening. Really appreciate you.